beginning, there was God. Nothing else. No trees, no seas, no whales or snails, or bats or cats. No puppies or guppies? Right. No stars or Mars, no human beings, not anything. Just God. But wasn't he kind of lonely? I sure would have been. <laughs> Me too. But God wasn't alone in all that nothingness. You see, God is like us in some ways. God thinks and feels and acts, but in other ways, he is very different. What do you mean, different? Well, for one thing, God is everywhere, all the time. Everywhere? Here, there, everywhere, all at the same time. Wow, that is different. And he knows everything. Everything? Every single thing. Wowee! He sure is smart. Yes, he is. And he is never, ever wrong. Oh, he sure is not like me or anyone I know. <laughs> You're right. And there's one other thing that makes God absolutely different than anyone else. And this one's kind of tricky. What's that? God is more than one. There is one God and there are three persons in God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Wait, what? There is one God, but there are three persons in God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Um, that's a little... Hard to understand? I know. I told you it was tricky. But that is why God wasn't lonely. Because he wasn't alone. There is love within God. There is friendship within God. There is family within God. That is amazing. He is amazing. And one day, this amazing God decided, it's time to begin. So he started making stuff. And boom, all of a sudden there were stars, planets, galaxies. Wow. And God said, Very good. Then he picked one particular planet and said, Watch this. God made the oceans, mountains, plants, and trees that grow. Tiny little leafy ones smaller than a pebble and big giant ones that climb toward the sun. God said, Very good. But he wasn't done. Next, he made all kinds of... Swimmy creatures. Crawly creatures. <laughs> Birds. And whales. Gentle sloths. And woolly mammoths. All the creatures God made were amazing. <laughs> Some so very short. And others so very tall. But something was missing. Really? What could possibly be missing? None of the creatures were like God. They couldn't think the way God thought, feel the way God felt, act the way God acted, and these creatures couldn't join the friendship that God had within himself. So, what did God do? He said, Watch this. And then, God made something super special. A creature that could think and feel and act just like he could think and feel and act. A creature that could join God's family. What was it? What did he make? He made a man and a woman. God made us. Then, he looked at everything he had made and God said, Very good. <laughs> Very 
very good indeed. This story is about Adam and Eve. In the beginning, he made darkness, and then the ways made lightness, and then he made creation, which is animals, birds, trees, and forests, and hills, and... Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible! Adam and Eve. In the beginning, God created a great big universe with tons of shining stars, a bright burning sun, and do you remember what else? Yep, planets. Right. Then he took a planet and filled it with so many special things. Earth. That's where we live. Right again. And on the Earth, he made two very special creatures. Oh, oh, I know. Um, a whale and a dinosaur. No, those aren't the creatures I'm talking about. Keep guessing. A platypus and sloth? A dog and a cat? A lizard and a blobfish? Oh, I give up. A man and a woman. I knew it. Well, actually, I didn't. But now I do. <laughs> God named the man Adam. And the woman he named Eve. Now, the earth was a pretty wild place. So, God planted a garden for Adam and Eve to live in. Wow! How cool is that? God called the garden Eden. And inside the garden, Adam and Eve had everything they needed. And best of all, we are friends with God. But friendship only works if there is something very important, trust. If Adam and Eve wanted to continue to be God's friends, they needed to trust him. They needed to listen to God. Trusting God should be easy, since he loves us so much, and he knows everything. And it was easy, for a while. Just a while? You see, there was this one tree. I thought there were lots of trees in the garden. Oh, there were. But there was this one particular tree in the garden that was different. God said, Don't eat from that tree. So they had a gazillion trees with all the fruit they could want. And just one they couldn't touch? Yep. Just that one? Uh-huh. <laughs> Easy peasy. It should have been. And Adam and Eve were just fine doing as God had told them, up until a new voice showed up in the garden. A new voice? Who was it? It was the voice of the enemy of God. And it was coming from a sneaky, tricky snake that said, Are you sure God said you can't eat the fruit from that tree? Oh, we're, we're sure. sure. God said that if we eat that fruit, we will die. And then the snake did something that no one had ever <laughs> done before in God's beautiful world. The snake lied. <laughs> you will surely not die. Huh? huh? No. If you eat of that tree, you'll become wise and smart like God. That doesn't sound right. So for sure they stopped listening to the sneaky snake and walked away, right? <sighs> no. What? No way! They thought about what the snake said. It would be great to be as wise as God. Then we'd know everything too. Hmm. What, what to, to do? do? What to do? What did they do? Adam and Eve decided to trust the snake and go their own way. 
They did what God told them not to do. They ate the fruit. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no! At that moment, sin entered God's wonderful world. You see, sin is when we ignore God and choose our own way, just like Adam and Eve did. That sneaky snake! He lied to Adam and Eve, and they listened to him instead of God. This is a terrible story. Yes, that snake was terribly <laughs> sneaky. And since Adam and Eve sinned, they had to leave the garden. But don't worry, the story's not over yet. It isn't? What happened next? God had a plan. He loved his creation, and he wasn't going to let some sneaky old snake spoil it. What that sneaky snake didn't know was that God was going to do something very special to save the world from sin and make things right again. I knew God wouldn't let that snake ruin everything. What happened to Adam and Eve? I sure do. Adam and Eve decided to trust a sneaky snake instead of God. And because of that, something really, really bad happened. Yes, sin entered the world. Sin is when we turn away from God and say, I don't care what you say, God. I'm going to do things my way. See, we can't be close to God when we turn away from him. Right. Wrong way. The sneaky snake knew that if he could get Adam and Eve to sin, then they couldn't be close to God. What a sneaky thing to do. Sneaky and bad. Because sin gets us into trouble. Hmm. This sign says God's way, but that way looks better. I'm going to go my own way. Oh. That must have hurt. And sin brings hurt, too. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. They couldn't be God's friends anymore. They had to live in the wild world, all by themselves. The wonder of God's garden was no longer a part of their lives. We shouldn't have eaten that fruit. Oh, now you tell me. Where were you when I was being tempted? Well, uh, I was right there! Exactly! <laughs> Just as I planned. God was very sad to see Adam and Eve living apart from him because of their sin, and to eventually see sin spread to their kids, and then their kids, and then their kids. Sin wrecked everything. It did. But guess what? God had a plan for us. Oh, good. Oh, triple good. What was it? A rescue plan. God had a plan to make things right. You mean by sending Jesus? Yes, to save Adam and Eve and their kids, and their kids' kids, and their kids' kids' kids, all the way down to us. Yippee! God's plan saves us from three things. The stain of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. What does that even mean? First, he wants to save us from the stain of sin. When we choose to sin and turn away from God, we have the stain of sin on us. But Jesus washes away our stain of sin and changes us into people who wants to be close to him. Right. Second, God wants to save us from the power of sin. The more we sin, the easier it is to keep on sinning. And soon, sin takes over our lives. But Jesus gives us the power to ignore the whispers of sin and live with peace and joy and love. 
That's way better than sin. It sure is. And third, even though God saves us from the stain of sin and the power of sin, we still live with the presence of sin. The presence of sin means we still live in a world where sin is all around us. Tears and hurt, selfishness and meanness. God wants to save us from the presence of sin. Uh, how? When the time is right, God will make it so his family can live in the wonderful world the way he meant it to be. But when will that happen? We don't know yet. When God says the time is right. So what happened with sin back then? God saw that sin was spreading. His beautiful world was drowning in sin. God knew there was only one way to stop his world from drowning in sin. What was that? Drown the sin. Adam and Eve had to leave the Garden of Eden and settle in a new place. Yes, because they sinned. They went their own way instead of God's way. Yep, and after a while they had kids. And then their kids had kids. Grandkids! And their grandkids had great-grandkids. Then the great-great-grandkids had kids. And as all those people spread around the world, Something else was spreading, too. Sin. People were choosing their own way instead of God's way. Fighting, stealing, lying and hurting each other, and making God's world a very ugly place. Until finally, God said, Enough. It's time to start over. Start over? How? God picked one person to start his world over again. Noah! Noah was a righteous man. He tried very hard to make right choices. In a world where everyone was doing their own thing, Noah was always ready to do what God asked. He had been practicing listening to God and being obedient for a long time. More than 500 years. How could anyone be that old? <laughs> People lived a long time back then. Are you all right? I was thinking about the candles on his birthday cake. Happy birthday! <laughs> I see. So God said to Noah, I want you to build a boat. What's a boat? A thing you can float in if there's a flood. What's a flood? It's when water covers everything. It's why you need a boat. How big? Big enough for your family and some animals. Uh, how many animals? All of them. Two of every kind. <laughs> then God gave him plans for building the big boat. Noah was already so old. Building a boat that big would take a long time. Right. It took Noah and his family years and years and years. Hey, Dad, are we done yet? Not yet. Now are we done? Nope. On top of that, Noah's neighbors probably came by to laugh at him. So it's called a boat. And it's for floating on water? Yep. <laughs> There's no water anywhere. Poor Noah. He was just doing what God told him. Yes, he wanted to be God's friend even if everyone else thought he was silly. <laughs> Finally, one day, a drop fell from the sky. Hey! Then another, and another, and another. And then... 
the animals started to come? Yep. God sent them to Noah, and Noah packed them all into his big, big boat. Now are we done? Then God closed the door. We are. The rain continued to come down, harder and harder. Suddenly, having a boat looked like a pretty good idea. The water rose higher and higher. God covered the land with water so that all the fighting and hurting died. But so did most of God's creation. That's sad. It was very sad. It rained and poured for 40 days. And Noah's big, big boat floated on the water 50 days, 60 days, 100 days, 150 days. That is a long time. It was. Then, finally, the water started to go down, 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 down. Until one day, Noah's big, big boat came to rest on top of a mountain. And God said, Let's start again. So, Noah and his family, plus a bunch of seasick animals, walked out of the big, big boat into a clean, fresh world. I have placed a rainbow in the sky as my promise that I will never again flood the earth. It was time to start again. Ever hear about God's three promises to Abraham? Yes, I have. Well, maybe, kind of, well, no. <laughs> well, a long, long time ago, God promised Abraham three things. Number one, his family would become a great nation. <laughs> Number two, they would have their very own land, the promised land. <laughs> and number three, through that nation would come a blessing for the whole world. Whoa! Yay! Whoa! Pretty great promises, huh? Really great promises. But then something happened. Uh oh! What? Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Israelites were stuck in Babylon far away from the Promised Land. So, it seemed like... None, none of those promises, promises are coming are true. true! Israel was supposed to be a great nation, but now they weren't a nation at all. How could a blessing for the whole world come from Israel now? We don't know! God's promises confused the Israelites living in Babylon. They wondered if these promises would still come true and if they could still trust God. Is our story over? Is this the end? Well, God knew how confused they were, so he sent the prophet Isaiah to give them one of the most important messages in the whole Bible. In the whole Bible? What was the message? It's not the end, Isaiah said. In fact, just wait till you hear what God is going to do next. Well, the Israelites were... Super excited! Yay! Why? Because Isaiah told them about... The Messiah! Wait, what's that? The Messiah? Messiah means anointed one. Samuel had anointed young David with oil, which means that he was being set apart by God for a very special job, to be king of all Israel. 
And now, Isaiah was saying that there was another anointed one coming. A baby will be born. He will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means God with us. But he would also have another name. The baby would be from King David's family, and he would grow up to rule God's people forever. Wow! Forever is like a really long time. It turns out the hope of the world wasn't a mighty nation or a big army. The hope of the world was going to be... A baby? <laughs> you got it. Now, can you guess the baby's name? Oh, I know, I know. Jesus. <laughs> oh, hey kids, we were just talking about Jesus' birthday. Happy birthday, baby Jesus. Oh, yeah, did you know that Jesus' birthday is on Christmas, Alendo? I do not understand. I mean, Alexius? I do not understand. Uh, whatever your name is, it's Jesus' birthday. Oh, yeah, true story, true story. Yeah. Baby Jesus is born in this barn next to goats and chickens and stuff. I think they called it a manager or something. Manger. Right, right, right. Manger. Right. And then these shepherds show up. And they're like, an angel told us to come. And so now you've got shepherds and sheep and goats and chickens. No, no, no. Not kittens, mittens. I said chickens. But there were probably kittens. Then, these wisey guys show up with these presents for baby Jesus. True story. True story. Oh, yeah. I wonder if those wisey guys brought these presents. What do you think, Altoona? I do not understand. Yeah, probably. You remember God's three promises to Abraham? Actually, I do. His family would become a great nation. They would have their very own land, the promised land. And through that nation, a blessing would come for the whole world. Right. Well, after 1,500 years, two of those promises had come true. Amazing! And what about the third promise? You mean the promise of the blessing for the whole world? The one that promised the Messiah? The Anointed One? That's the one! Had that one come true too? Uh, no. Oh. Many years had passed since the time Isaiah had spoken about that promise, and the Israelites, well, you can imagine what they were saying. Where's the blessing? Where's the Messiah? Is he ever going to show up? Oh, we're, we're starting, starting to lose hope. hope. But then, something amazing happened. Really? What? In a village called Nazareth, there was a young woman named... Mary. One day, God sent an angel to give her a special message. A special message? What was it? The angel said, You will have a son. A son? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not even married. Mary wasn't married yet, but she had promised to marry a man named... Joseph. Then the angel said something truly amazing. The baby will be a blessing for the whole world. He will be... The Son of God. That's the promise they were waiting for. Yes, Mary would give birth to the Son of God, the blessing for the whole world. That's so amazing. And if you were shocked to hear about this, 
You can imagine what Mary must have felt like. Why, you would think she would have passed out and fallen on the floor right then. Uh. But Mary was brave. She trusted God. And she said, I am the servant of the Lord. May this happen just as you have said. Wow! Mary really trusted God. Yes, she did. Then the angel said, The baby's name will be Jesus. Was this the Messiah the people had been waiting for? <laughs> you got it! I knew it! So then what happened? Well, when it was time for the baby to be born, Joseph and Mary traveled to a place called Bethlehem. Was that a long ways away? It was, and they got there by... A donkey! That must have been hard. I think so. And on top of that, when they got to Bethlehem, they suddenly needed a place for Mary to have the baby. Oh, did they look for a hospital? <laughs> they didn't have hospitals back then. What about a palace? I mean, the Son of God should be born in the best place, right? Well... They... Or the best hotel? All the inns were full. So, what did they do? Since all the inns were full, Mary had her baby in... <laughs> a barn? A barn, the blessing that Israel had been awaiting for almost 2,000 years, was born in a... <laughs> a barn. Oh, my! Mary didn't have her baby in a fancy palace or a nice warm inn. Nope. Jesus was born in a stinky, smelly barn next to cows and sheep and goats and chickens. The promised blessing for the whole world had finally come, but he didn't arrive quite the way people expected. Kids, we were just talking about Christmas lights. The important thing to know is before you start to make sure the lights are off. Okay. Oh, yes, Mittens, I know the lights are off. Uh, did you notice that the lights are off, Alanto? I do not understand. I mean, Africa? I do not understand. Whatever your name is, the lights are off. <laughs> it's dark in here. <laughs> that reminds me of the other day when I was outside. Well, the other day I was an outside tree, and then I get chopped down. Chippity chop, now I'm an inside tree. <laughs> but it was so dark out there. Only these teeny tiny stars for light. Nothing like that Christmas star the wisey men had to guide their way. Ah, oh, that'd be so nice with the lights on. Okay. Whoa, that worked. <laughs> hey, yeah, oh, that's so much better than when the lights are off. Okay. Uh-oh. Yes, Mittens, I know. The lights are all... Little Laugh and Grow Bible <laughs> Shepherds and Angels God kept His promise to Israel. The Messiah had come. And although He was born in a humble barn and not in a fancy palace or the best inn, God's kingdom celebrated in a most amazing Amazing way. Really? How? Like this. Angels. A whole bunch of them showed up, and they sang and celebrated the birth of the new king. King Jesus. And where do you think God's mighty angels announced the birth of his son? Oh, I know. That's easy. 
They probably announced it in the biggest cities to the richest, fanciest, most important people of the whole wide world. Like kings and queens. No. Powerful generals? Ah, guess again. Oh, really rich people? <laughs> nope. Maybe this will help. <laughs> Shepherds. L look! Shepherds? Remember that God chose a humble barn for the birth of his son? Yeah, that is so weird. Right? I guess God doesn't do things the way we think he should. I guess not. So, the angels appeared in the middle of a field outside the city. That's right! They sang to shepherds. They did! Dirty, smelly guys. Hey! With dirty, smelly sheep. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. God wanted to show how his love is for everyone, even the most gentle and lowly. Yay! <laughs> Go. You will recognize the Messiah by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in a blanket and lying in a manger. Go and see him. God showed the world his power, who he really was. Not with an army, but with a baby. Not in a palace, but in a barn. Not to kings and rich people, but to us, shepherds. God's rescue plan was happening. His kingdom was on the move. He was showing that his way of working was not going to be the way that people expected. It was going to be different. Yes, that little tiny newborn baby. Born in a barn. Celebrated by shepherds. Was going to turn the whole world... Whoa! Upside down. Ah. Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible <laughs> The Wise Men Do you know who this is? Oh, that's baby Jesus. I can tell, because I know he was born in a barn. <laughs> yep, born in a barn instead of a palace. No one expected that. Do you know what else happened? Um, oh, a whole bunch of angels and shepherds showed up to celebrate. <laughs> and that's not even the whole story. There's more? Oh, yes. Sometime later, some wise men from the east followed a bright star in the sky to Jerusalem. They were really excited. Where can we find the newborn king? We saw his star in the sky. We want to worship him. And, and bring, bring him, him gifts, gifts, too. When the people heard about a new baby king, they got really excited, too. And soon the news reached King Herod. There was already a king? King Herod. And he was ruler over all the land. Well, when he heard all the talk about a new king, he got a little worried. So he called his counselors together. Counselors! I need to know where the child king is supposed to be born. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> In Bethlehem. Aha! So Herod had the wise men brought to him right away and said, As soon as you find the child, let me know because I want to worship him too. Hmm. Okay. So the wise men continued on their way, following the star. That must have been so awesome! Their very own compass in the sky! That's right! Soon the star stopped over the place 
where Jesus was. Ooh. We saw his star in the sky. We bring gifts fit for a king. Gold. Frankincense. Myrrh. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Wow. And then they went back to tell King Herod that they have found Jesus. Nope. What? Why not? God warned the wise men not to go back to King Herod. You see, Herod didn't really want to worship Jesus. He didn't? Not at all. Herod was jealous of the new baby king. So, after the wise men left Jesus and his family, an angel spoke to Jesus' dad, Joseph, in a dream and said, Take the baby and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod is looking for the child. Phew! So, Jesus was safe? Yes, he was. Yay! Jesus would grow up with his earthly parents in a faraway land until it was time to begin the work his heavenly father had sent him to do. Kids, we were just talking about joy. I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Well, down in my heart. Well, down in my heart. I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Well, down in my. Oh no. Um. Do trees have hearts, Alessa? I do not understand. Uh. Altuna. I do not understand. Mittens, help me out here. Nah, whatever your name is, I love the word joy. Man, it's just fun to say. Joy! And then you're like, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us receive the King. I don't even know the word. Jesus is the Son of God and He, he forgives us. He never, ever dies. He's a powerful King of Earth. He can, he can feed 5,000 of people in just a few breads and fish. That's so crazy, right? The people are like, what? He, he died and that man, he forgave us of all of our sins. Jesus made a miracle, a big miracle. He just came back to life and some people just thought he Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible <laughs> It's a miracle! Jesus and his disciples went all over Israel showing everyone what the kingdom of God was like. Do you know how he did that? <laughs> oh, that's easy! By teaching them. Well, yes, but also by doing amazing, unbelievable, incredible, unimaginable things called miracles. Wow! But, uh, what's a miracle? Miracles are signs that show people how powerful Jesus is. Let me tell you about three of his miracles. One night, Jesus was on a boat with his disciples when... Oh no! A huge storm has taken over the sea! We're going to sink! We're going to die! What are we going to do? Meanwhile, Jesus was... Sleeping? Like a baby. So... One of the disciples said, Uh, excuse me? Excuse me, Jesus? Yes, what is it? We're all going to die! So, Jesus sat up and said, 
Why are you so afraid? Then he turned to the giant storm and said, Stop! And guess what happened? The storm stopped. Wow! Jesus spoke to the storm and it obeyed him. Yep. Jesus was showing his disciples that in the kingdom of God, we have nothing to fear because... Jesus is the king of everything. Yes, he is. Another time, Jesus was surrounded by thousands of people who had followed him far away from town with no food to eat. Boy, am I hungry. Me too. Wish I'd brought a snack. Wish I'd brought two snacks. So, one of the disciples asked Jesus, Uh, excuse me, Jesus. Uh, how are we going to feed all these people? Will this help? Five loaves of bread and two small fish? <laughs> Five loaves, two... <laughs> you can't feed thousands of people with this. Are you sure? Hmm. But Jesus took the boy's gift and prayed over it. Then he started breaking pieces off and giving them to the people. And then there were more pieces. And more pieces. And more pieces. So many pieces that... Look! Every person got to eat as much as they wanted. Another miracle! The disciples must have been so surprised. Oh, they were. Jesus was giving them another sign. In God's kingdom, there is always enough. Enough food, enough warmth, enough love. Because Jesus is the king of everything. You're catching on. And another time, a desperate man ran to Jesus saying, My daughter is sick and dying. Can you please help her? By the time Jesus got to their house, the little girl had died. Oh, no! But Jesus said, Don't worry. She's okay. And the little girl came back to life, just like that. This was a sign that Jesus is king over sickness and disease. Jesus is the king of everything! Yes, he is. In the kingdom of God, there is no sickness or death. People must have been so excited. Oh, they were, but not all of them. Who wouldn't be excited about the miracles? I'll tell you, the religious leaders, the Pharisees. We keep track of all the rules, and we're not excited at all. Yeah, Jesus is getting too popular. Some people even call him a king. We gotta do something about this. So, the Pharisees went to the Sadducees. We're the ones in charge of punishing the people that break the rules. Let's talk. <laughs> the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't like all the amazing miracles Jesus was doing. How could they not be amazed by the miracles? Because they were too afraid Jesus would take over their jobs. Jesus is the king over everything. That's right. And God was about to use him to do the most incredible miracle of all time. Really? Yep. So the Pharisees and Sadducees began looking for a way to arrest Jesus to stop him from doing the work his father had sent him to do. Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible <laughs> The Last Supper it was time for Jesus and his disciples to celebrate the Passover. Passover? What is Passover? Do you remember when God sent Moses to rescue the Israelites from Egypt? Oh, yes. God sent frogs and flies and darkness and other things. 
It was pretty crazy. It was. God sent plague after plague, ten plagues. But Pharaoh still refused to let God's people go. He said, No, I will not let God's people go. So it was time for Pharaoh to see just how powerful God can be. What happened next? God told Moses to have every Israelite family prepare a lamb for a special meal, and then take some of the blood from that lamb and put it over the door of their houses. Why would God tell them to do that? Because, for the last plague, God would send an angel to take the life of every firstborn son of the Egyptians. The angel would pass over the homes of the Israelites who had the blood of the lamb over their doors. So, the blood of the lamb... Saved the sons of the Israelites. And ever since that day, the Israelites have celebrated Passover with a special meal, just like the one they had that night in Egypt when the angel passed over their homes many, many years earlier. I get it now. So, Jesus and his disciples traveled to Jerusalem, where many people gathered to celebrate Passover. And something very wonderful happened when he got there. Oh, really? What? As Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, a big crowd of people came to meet him. They knew who he was? Yes, they were so excited. They waved palm branches and then laid them down in front of him. That's funny. What did they do that for? It was their way of honoring Jesus. Like a welcome mat. That's so cool. And then they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! It was like a parade. A parade for a king. Everyone was so happy. Wait! 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 Stop everything! We're not happy at all. Not one teeny bit. Ah, yes. The Pharisees and Sadducees. Those religious leaders weren't happy. They were very nervous. Hey! Jesus is such a troublemaker. If the Romans hear people calling him king, they will send their soldiers to throw us in prison. We need to stop Jesus and his followers. So they came up with a secret plan to hurt Jesus. Oh no, they can't hurt Jesus. Don't worry, even this was part of God's plan. Later that night, Jesus and his disciples got together to eat the Passover meal, just like they did every year. But this year was different. During the meal, Jesus got up and washed his disciples' feet to show them what it really means to love and serve others. Then, Jesus said something that surprised them all. One of you is going to turn against me. Oh no! Why did he say that? Uh, he knew that one of them was helping the Pharisees and Sadducees. Were the disciples surprised? For sure! They looked at each other and said, Who could it be? Jesus knew what was going to happen. He wanted to prepare his followers. So he took a piece of bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Then he picked up his cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you. What did he mean by that? What does cov... cov... Covenant. What does that mean? A covenant is a promise. Many years before, God had made a covenant, a promise, to bless his people. Now, Jesus was saying that God was going to make a new covenant with them. He was going to bless them in a new way. But when he said, This is my body. This is my blood. It sounded like this new covenant had something to do with Jesus dying, and it did. What do you mean? Why would Jesus have to die? Remember when the angel in Egypt saw the blood of the lamb over the door? What did he do? Um, he passed over the house. 
and the people were safe. Jesus was saying that now his body and blood would save them. He was saying that he was the new Passover lamb. Whoa! The disciples could not believe their ears. Then, after dinner, Jesus took some of his disciples and went to a garden to pray. He knew what he had to do next, and he knew it was not going to be easy. After a while, he said, The hour has come. And just at that moment, one of his disciples arrived, leading a group of soldiers sent by the Sadducees to arrest Jesus. Which disciple was it? The disciple named Judas. Now everyone knew who had turned against Jesus. With the help of Judas, the Pharisees and Sadducees arrested Jesus. <gasps> Just like they planned. But you know what? Things did not go the way they planned. the dark because it makes it hard to be found. Sometimes I get a little scared in the dark. I think I probably should have brought a flashlight or something. <clears throat> but when I get worried, I remember the Bible verse that says that even if I walk through a dark valley, I will not be afraid because you are with me. I am with you. I've been here the whole time. I was talking about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was going around doing the work God had sent him to do, healing people, <laughs> and teaching them all about the kingdom of God. But the Pharisees and Sadducees thought Jesus was getting too popular, so they had him arrested in the middle of the night. Oh no! What did they do to him? They asked him a lot of questions. Are you the Son of God? Do you think you are equal to God? Jesus didn't say anything, but the religious leaders didn't care if he answered or not. They accused him anyway. He is guilty of blasphemy! 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 Blasphemy? What does that even mean? Blasphemy is when someone says untrue things about God. The Pharisees and Sadducees accused Jesus of saying he was God. According to the Pharisees and Sadducees, there was only one way a person could pay for that. What was it? Going to jail? No, death. No! There was a problem for the Pharisees and Sadducees, though. What? Even if the Pharisees and Sadducees said Jesus was guilty, they weren't allowed to kill anyone. Only Roman leaders could do that. So they took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Wait, what? Pancho the Pilate? Not a Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And when he saw Jesus and his accusers, he was a little confused. <laughs> Are they upset? <laughs> what have you done that has made everyone so angry? Again, Jesus didn't say anything. So Pilate turned to the religious leaders and said, I don't see anything wrong with this man. Well, according to our rules, he needs to die. Now, Pilate had a problem. Hmm, Jesus doesn't deserve to die. But, but if he gets more popular, I don't want the Pharisees and Sadducees to complain about me to the other Roman leaders. So, what did he do? He thought there was only one way to keep his job as Roman governor. Hmm. Well, 
What are you going to do? Uh, bring me some water. I wash my hands of this situation. This is not my fault. So, Pilate ordered that Jesus be killed on a wooden cross. Because... According to our laws, he deserves to die. <gasps> that is so sad. Jesus didn't deserve to die on the cross. No, he didn't. But he went to the cross anyway. And as he was dying, he continued to show love and mercy by saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. The sky turned very dark, and Jesus said, It is finished. Jesus died. Then the ground began to shake, and a Roman guard standing nearby said, this man must have been the Son of God. But where were the disciples? All of Jesus' friends. His mother was with him, and a few of his friends. The others probably didn't know what to think. How could Jesus be the Messiah, the blessing for the whole world, if he wasn't even alive? Jesus had done some amazing things while he was living. Like lots of miracles. That's right! Stop! And he'd shown everyone that God the Father was very loving and good and powerful. He had also promised that the kingdom of God was near. He'd given everyone a taste of that kingdom through those miracles. What's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is when the whole world will be made new again the way God had always wanted it to be. Jesus promised that someday, in the kingdom of God, there will be no sin or sadness or sickness or death. What is sin again? Sin is when we ignore God and go our own way. Sin is when we say, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it my way. And remember, because God is good and sin is bad, the price we pay for our sin is being apart from God. Oh, so in the kingdom of God, there will be no sin or sadness or sickness. In the kingdom of God, there will be nothing to be afraid of, not even death. But Jesus had just died. Ah, so it seemed like none of those promises were coming true. But that was not the case. Really? What do you mean? You see, something more amazing was happening that Jesus' enemies didn't realize. When he died on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin on himself. He did? You see, since our sin turns us away from God, there can be no sin in the kingdom of God. So, Jesus had to fix the problem of sin. And he did that by dying on the cross? Yes. By dying on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sins. Yours, mine, everyone's. Wow! Jesus really loves us. He sure does. But... Another question? What about all the things that he said about the kingdom? I still don't get it. If Jesus was dead, how could any of those promises come true? That's a really good question. With an even better answer. Because he didn't stay dead. Like the rock that rolled away from Jesus' tomb? 
No, not shh. I think it would have sounded more like rumble, 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 rumble. <laughs> you know what? I guess, I guess it does sound like that. You were right. Awesome job. <laughs> Jesus had been betrayed. He was arrested and put to death on a cross. It was a sad day. Yes, Jesus gave his life for us. The sun had gone down, and it was time to bury him. Only his mom and a few friends were there. You remembered. So what did they do? They got help from a man. I am Joseph from Arimathea, a follower of Jesus. I am very sad that Jesus has died. I have been waiting for the kingdom he spoke of to come. I want to do something nice for him, to show Jesus how much I loved him. So Joseph did something special. He went to Pontius Pilate. I want to take care of Jesus' body. I want to give him a grave. All right, go ahead. Now, when important people died in Israel, they were not buried in the ground. Really? No, their bodies were placed in special tombs that were carved out of solid rock. Do you mean like a cave? Like a small cave. Well, Joseph had one that he was going to use someday, but guess what? He decided to give it to Jesus. So, Jesus' body was placed inside Joseph's tomb, and then a big rock was rolled in front of the cave, so no one could get in. And then... Someone is here to see you, Pilate. Oh, it's you again. Yup, we're back! You didn't think we'd give up that easily, did you? <sighs> What do you want? Look, Jesus said that he would come back from the dead. And? Well, what if his friends go to the tomb, move the rock, and take his body and then say, Jesus is alive? Hmm. That would cause a lot of trouble for you, Pilate. Hmm, I never thought of that. So Pilate put guards outside the tomb to make sure no one moved the rock. Eyes peeled. We don't want anyone to move this rock. Yeah, no one's gonna get past us. No, sir. Wow, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees were still worried about Jesus? Yep. You see, when Jesus was alive, he said, In three days, I will rise from the dead. Well, Jesus had died and was buried on a Friday. That's day one. All day Saturday, his body lay in Joseph's tomb with the guards keeping watch. That was day two? Right. So Sunday morning comes around. Day three. And two women who were Jesus' friends made their way to the tomb to put spices and perfume on his body, cause that was something that people did in those days. When all of a sudden... Ah! Oh, oh, oh! What happened? What, what happened? happened? An earthquake shook the ground, and an angel appeared. <laughs> the angel rolled away the rock. When the women arrived, there lay the two soldiers, passed out on the ground. There lay the rock, and there, well, there was no Jesus. Don't be afraid. Oh, uh, okay. I know you're looking for Jesus, but he isn't here. He has risen, just like he said he would. Jesus is alive. What? What? 
women were so excited. They wanted to go tell their other friends what happened. When suddenly... Don't be afraid. Jesus showed up? He sure did. No way! Yes way. Later, Jesus appeared to all his disciples. He explained to them why he had to die. He told them the great news that death has no power in God's kingdom. And then, when it was time for him to leave, he said, From now on, you will be the ones telling others about my kingdom. I will send you a helper who will fill you with the power of God. You will do amazing things. And then, Jesus rose up into the sky. Amazing! The disciples were very excited. They didn't really know what would happen next, but they knew one thing. Jesus was sending them a helper who would help them in a mighty big way. I just love Christmas music. We should sing a song to open the show. It's got to be quick. Which one should we do? Jingle bells? No. Oh, Holy Night? Too high. Deck the halls. Yeah! Ready? Deck! It's Coco Talk! Today's guest, a candle with a message about Advent, and our friend Fruitcake with a Christmas stud spectacular. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha! It's Advent season, everyone! And you know, I love events! No, not events, Advent! You know what Advent is, right? One of those metal things in the wall that blows out air? No, that's an air vent. I'm saying Advent. So, two metal thingies. Advent is the season before Christmas. Every Sunday, we light a new candle to get us ready for the day Jesus was born. One candle for hope, one for love, one for peace, and one for joy. And it just so happens that today, one of our guests is an actual Advent what? candle. Which one is it? Don't tell me. It's peace. Right? No, wait. Joy. Are you Joy? You have to tell me. Oh, wait. First, we have a clip. I'm guessing that's you, Joy. Or Hope. Your Hope. Look, fire. Speaking of fire, I'm burning to talk to our guest today. Let's not wait any longer. Oh no, we've run out of time. My apologies too. I want to say peace. Definitely peace. And fruitcake, so sorry. We didn't get to you again. We'll make it happen. I'll talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. <laughs> Did you guys see that thing this week? What was up with that, right? Incredible. I mean, things, right? We should have written some jokes for this part. Probably. It's Coco Talk. Today's guest, Lily Lightbulb, with a story behind an old tradition. And our friend Fruitcake is here to sing a Christmas opera. Now our hosts, Coco and... Welcome, everybody. We're so excited to have Lily Lightbulb on the show today. Marsha, did you know that before light bulbs like Lily existed, people used to put candles on their trees? That sounds wildly dangerous. Agreed. That's why Christmas lights are the best. All the magic of Christmas. Electrified and safe, colorful, blinky lights. Seeing Christmas lights sends me back to my childhood. Their warm glow outside the window, the sound of my dad attempting to unravel them from an impossibly tangled ball in the garage, the security of knowing our tree isn't decorated with open flames. Amen! But what they really remind me of is all the stars that were shining bright in the sky above Jesus the night he was born, and how he's the true light of the world for us. Forever! I don't think any light bulbs last forever. Do they? You know what? Why don't we just ask our guests? Everyone, Lily the Light! Well, gee, 
Jingle Bells. Looks like we have run out of time. Much like Lily will one day. Sorry about that, Lily. We'll get to you next time. And Fruitcake. Wow, I feel terrible. Once again, we did not make it to you at all. Yeah, our bad on that one, pal. I'll talk to you all next time on Coco, Coco Talk. Talk. Marcia, give me a beat. My name is Coco and I might run hot, but I keep it cool. Cause he talk a lot. Wait, I talk a lot? Uh... It's Coco Talk. Today's guest. Hannah Bell here on behalf of her choir and our friend Fruitcake with a must-have Christmas recipe. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Welcome everyone. Did I not silence my phone? Your phone is ringing. This is embarrassing. Hello, Marsha? Is that you? Hi Coco. Cool ringtone. Thanks. But that's not all that's ringing today. We have a very special guest. Annabelle is here. Ooh, what kind of bell is she? Jingle bell? Sleigh bell? Cowbell? Annabelle is a handbell. She's part of the handbell choir. I want to hear them. Well, we do have a special sneak peek from their brand new Christmas album. Let's play it now. Is that Annabelle? Or that one? Or that one? Huh, maybe not that one. I think that one. Maybe that one. I can't tell. Wow, her choir is so talented. You know, Marsha, this reminds me of the church. Just like Annabelle is one special part of her choir, we all have our own special gifts to use for God as part of something bigger. Yeah, we all make up his church. That's so beautiful, just like the song. Also, I'm pretty sure Anna had the solo in the middle. Like, 99% sure. Well, there's only one way to find out. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Anna Ben. Oh no, we've run out of time again. Too bad you aren't an alarm bell, Anna. Am I right? Maybe so. Anna, so sorry about that. And Fruitcake, I don't know what to say, man. I was really looking forward to hearing that Christmas recipe of yours. I'll talk to you all next time on Coco, Coco Talk. Whoa, Marcia! What happened to the studio? Isn't it great? I froze the floor. You did this on purpose. Well, how else were we gonna practice ice skating? Or falling down real hard? I'm okay. It's Coco Talk. Today's guest, Bob Bobble, on the art of tree decor and our friend Fruitcake with some last minute gift ideas. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Hang on to your branches, everyone. We've got a very special ornament today that's a member of the Bobble family. I love bobbleheads. I guess I'm kind of your bobblehead. Even when you stay still, I can swirl the round and round. I'm not a bobblehead, a bobble is usually a round glass ornament like Bob here. Bobble, 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 bobble. Bobbles are just one type of ornament. There's also cross stitch ones, popsicle stick ones, even pickles. Pickles? Yeah, believe it or not, parents used to hide a glass pickle ornament in their tree for kids to find on Christmas day. Was it like a special pickle? Just a pickle. Could it sing and dance? Doubt it. But what I love about ornaments is that they can remind us of God's great gifts throughout our lives. Like family memories, which apparently, depending on your family, may or may not involve pickle. Speaking of family, we have a special surprise for Bob here. <gasps> Bob's whole extended family live on video. There's your Uncle Rob, Cousins Bob, Bertie, Bobby, Robbie, Auntie Roberta, Grandpa Robert, and Denise. A lot of Bobs in there. I wonder if it's a family name. Great question. Let's ask. Oh, Tannenbaum, we almost got there. Why do we always get ourselves into this pickle? Bob, thanks for hanging around with us. And Fruitcake, I just want you to know I see you and I know you're there. I'll talk to you all next time on Coco, Coco Talk. I can't get that song out of my head. In Excel, she is gay. Has it been 
you this whole time? Yes! Do you want to hear my guitar solo? It's Coco Talk! Today's guest, Treetop Angel, bringing good tidings of great joy. And our friend Fruitcake reading a chapter from his new book, For Goodness Cake. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Today's show is going to be amazing. We are so, so, so excited to have Treetop Angel with us today. Wow, living on top of a Christmas tree. I wonder if she's ever been scared of heights. Scared? Like the shepherds were when the real angels declared the birth of Jesus? Shepherds were scared? Remember in Luke 2 when the angel said, Do not be afraid! Oh, right. And then they said, <clears throat> Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then a whole bunch more angels showed up. Oh, yeah. I'd love to see that. Well, why don't we? Let's go to a clip. All oh, right, they didn't have cameras back then. That's okay, I can reenact it. Cue the lights. Hey, look at me, I'm a shepherd. Do, 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 do. Just doing shepherd stuff. No surprises in store for me today. Boom, angels, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And shepherds were like, what? They were probably Totally like that. And then the shepherds were like, let's go run and tell everyone we see about Jesus. We can get there faster if we take the helicopter. I don't think the shepherds had a helicopter. You sure? Pretty sure. But why don't we ask our friend? Everyone, please welcome Treetop Angel. Oh no, we ran out of time. Sorry about that, Treetop Angel and Fruitcake. Man, I really thought this was our day. Well. I'll talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. Marsha, there's flowers in the studio. Isn't it great? Ah, spring flowers make everything feel fresh and new. They also make for a fun game of Marsha Coco. Marsha. Coco. Marsha. Coco. Marsha. Coco. It's Coco Talk. Today's guest. A family of frogs with a message about Easter. And our friend Fruitcake with tips for finding hidden eggs. Now, our hosts, Coco and Marsha. It's Palm Sunday, everyone. Time for a parade. A parade? Ooh, I love parades. Confetti, floats, candy. Well, there's no candy on Palm Sunday. But when Jesus entered Jerusalem, everyone waved big palm branches. Were the palm branches made of candy? I don't think so. But palm branches are a sign of royalty. And Jesus was, and still is, the King of Kings. And guess what? Today, we have actual palm branches in the studio. The Frond family is here. The friend family? The Frond family. I think you're saying friend funny. Our friends are a family of fronds. A palm frond is the same thing as a palm branch. Oh, so where is this friendly frond family from? Florida. Here's a clip. Wish I could wave like that. Maybe they can teach us. Let's ask. Oh man, we're out of time already? Appreciate you being here, Franz. And Fruitcake, we're pretty fond of you, too. I see what you did there. I'll talk to you all next time on Coco, Coco Talk. Talk. It's so hot. Huh. I hadn't noticed. I can't go on. You know what they say. If you can't handle the heat, Get out of the cocoa. Now that's much better. <laughs> it's Cocoa Talk. Today's guest, Ivan the Ice Water with a message about living well. And our friend Fruitcake with tips for beating the heat. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha.
Welcome! Ivan the Ice Water is our super cool guest today. Right, Marsha? Marsha? Ah. Hey there, fellow uh, floaty. Not super talkative, is he? There's nothing as refreshing as ice water on a hot day. I love ice water, but it's nothing compared to sparkling water and definitely doesn't measure up to living water. You mean water that talks? No, living water is what Jesus offered to the woman at the well. Did she drink it? Not exactly. You don't actually drink the kind of water Jesus offered her. He knew what the woman really needed was eternal life that comes when we have faith in him. Eternal? That's like forever. Exactly. Refreshing water forever sounds amazing. Before we dive in with Ivan, we have footage of some really big ice water in his homeland. Now that's a floaty. Let's find out more about how Ivan handles the heat. Oh man, we're out of time already? Thanks for chilling with us, Ivan. We should get you out of here before you melt. And fruitcake. We're sorry again, but you always keep it fresh. Talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. Um, Marsha, what are you doing? I'm practicing impressions. You mean you can sound like other people? Cool. Who can you do? Well, you, Coco. Really? I'd love to hear it. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Coco, a blue mug with a delightful, hilarious, quick-witted marshmallow co-host. That's pretty good. Who else can you do? I can do the announcer. Listen. It's Coco Talk! Today's guest, Sammy the Slingshot, to discuss the importance of accuracy. And our friend Fruitcake with a family recipe for shepherd's pie. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha! Hello everyone! We are super excited for today's show. Sammy the Slingshot is here! Do you know who she reminds me of? David Slingshot. Like THE David Slingshot? Yep, David the Shepherd who became David the King. His Slingshot. Oh, that's so old school. Not to mention Old Testament. Wouldn't it be funny if the next guest on the show was the rock who flew out of the slingshot and hit Goliath? We tried to book him. He's on tour with his rock band. So he's a rock star? Get it? David was another kind of rock star. He was outsized by Goliath and faced him with nothing but a slingshot, a stone, and faith that God would win. And he did. Wow. So it didn't matter that Goliath was bigger because God was on David's side. Nothing really matters because you have God on your side. Here's a reenactment. I wonder if slingshots ever get dizzy spinning round and round and round and round and round. And round. Great question. Why don't we ask? Out of time so soon? Well, Sammy, we have to swing back to you. And fruitcake, Marcia and I were really wanting to have that shepherd's pie for dinner. Wait, what are we having for dinner now? No idea. But we'll talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. Whoa. Wow. Oh, no. Marcia, what exactly is all over the floor? Beads. They are all the rage. And when I heard we had bees on the show, I wanted them to feel at home. We have bees on the show. That's what I said. Bees. Not beads. Bees. You know, honey. Got it, honey. Sweetie pie. It's Coco Talk. Today's guests are a couple of bees with a message about the Beatitudes. And our friend Fruitcake on flower decorating. Now, our hosts, Coco and Marsha! Welcome, everyone! Today, we're talking about Beatitudes. Yep, bees who have attitude. Right? 
Totally. Wow, you can speak B? I guess I do. Will you ask them about the Beatitudes? Is that a B band? Never heard of them. What's the buzz? No, in the Bible, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about how we can be. The Beatitudes are like opposites. Like smiley and frowny, daytimey and nighttimey, hot cocoa and cold cocoa. More like when sad things happen, you can be happy because God will comfort you. Oh. It's about choosing to be joyful, well, which is what God wants for us. Even when something is hard? That sounds backwards. I know, opposites. Before I forget, we have footage of the bee's beautiful handiwork. Sweet! I'll say. How long did it take you to make? <laughs> Interesting. What did they say? <laughs> oh man, left on a cliffhanger. Well, thanks for being here, friends. And Fruitcake, we really wanted to hear about your new flower decorating hobby. Talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. <laughs> It's winter, my favorite time of the year. I thought summer was your favorite. Sunshine and swimming pools. That is pretty great too. Or spring with beautiful flowers blooming and celebrating Easter. I do love Easter. Or fall with all the colorful leaves and nice cool weather. Wow, there are so many great seasons. How do you even pick a favorite? You know you don't have to choose, right? Oh, phew. It's Coco Talk! Today's guest, a snowball on behalf of the snow community. And our friend Fruitcake with a snow angel demonstration. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Well, welcome. We froze in the studio today for our guest, Sunny the Snowball. Pretty cold for a son, aren't you? Can I call you Sun, Sunny? Sunny? Sunny is a snowball. Do you know that snowballs are made out of thousands of individual snowflakes? When they're all packed together, they form a strong bond. Wow, that's amazing. It's like the Bible says, <clears throat> a group of snowflakes is not easily broken. I think it says a rope of three strands is not easily broken. A rope of three strands? You mean like a braid? Yeah, like a braid. The point is, a community is also stronger together. What's a community? It's a group that shares something in common, like a neighborhood, school, or church. Like me, you, and Fruitcake. I'm glad you guys are my community. Back at you, Marsha. Before we hear from Sonny, let's take a look at his home community. That's a good-looking community. It really warms your heart. Maybe winter is the best time of the year, along with spring, summer, and fall. Before we freeze, let's ask our snowy friend. What do you think the best season is? Oh, no. Ran out of time again. Thanks for being here, Sonny. Sorry we didn't get to hear from you. And Fruitcake, I really did want to see your snow angel demonstration. Yeah, that would have been cool. Or, you know, cold. See you all next time on Coco Talk. Meow. Meow. Hmm, maybe more like, meow. What are you doing? Getting ready to talk to our guests, the kittens. Not kittens, mittens. Mittens? Fluffy and Muffy are a pair of mittens. Huh. Do they also speak cat? I don't think so. Oh. It's Coco Talk! Today's guest, a pair of mittens with a message about accountability. And our friend Fruitcake with fashion tips for your winter wardrobe. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha! Welcome! We're talking to Fluffy and Muffy Mittens today about being a good team. A dynamic duo. A perfect pair. Partners in crime. Well, not crime. But they are accountability partners. 
What's an accountability partner? It's someone who holds you responsible for your actions. Like how it's not good to fill up on cookies before dinner, and the other day you reminded me to only have one cookie? Exactly. We look out for each other. In the Bible, Paul says to encourage one another and build each other up. So are we accountability partners? Yeah, I guess we are. Then I should tell you, I'm responsible for eating the last cookie yesterday. I knew it! But we're getting off topic. We usually have a clip, but I really wanted to make sure we get to our guest today. What's it like for you two to look out for each other? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding you. Hmm, maybe we should move on to fruitcake. Okay, fruitcake, what would you like to add? Oh man, we were so close to finally getting an interview. Thanks for being here, Mittens. And Fruitcake, we almost got to you. And I really wanted to hear your winter fashion tips. Yeah, Coco could have used them. I sure could. See you all next time on Coco Talk. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, dear Coco. Happy New Year to you. That was great. Now it's your turn. My turn to what? To sing Happy New Year to me. Um, I don't think that's a thing most people do. Please. Okay. Uh, it's Coco Talk. Today's guest, a New Year's ball with the story of Paul and our friend Fruitcake bringing a word about fresh starts. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Welcome everyone. We have Ned the New Year's Ball here who drops from a skyscraper to ring in the new year. Wow, what a way to celebrate new beginnings. Speaking of new beginnings, Ned is here to tell us about Paul. He was a guy in the Bible who made a lot of bad choices, but then he met Jesus and was never the same. Wait, wasn't that guy's name Saul? Actually, his name was Saul, but after he met Jesus, his name was changed to Paul. In the Bible, new beginnings often came with a new name. So if a new year is like a new beginning, do I need to change my name every January? I've always wanted something totally different, like Martha, or maybe Monica. Nah, how about Maria? No need to change your name, but the Bible says when we meet Jesus, we get to start over too. Sweet! Like a do-over. Yeah. Did you know after Paul's new beginning, he ended up writing most of the New Testament? I knew he sounded familiar. Before we hear from Ned, I thought we could do a New Year's Eve style countdown. Count me in. 10, 9, 8, I'm seven, so excited. 6, me too. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year! Fun. Let's do it again. No, we need to get to our guest. All right. So, Ned, what do new beginnings mean to you? I should have known the countdown would cue the music. Thanks for being here, Ned. And Fruitcake, we really would have loved to hear your take on Fresh Starts, too. Happy New Year, everyone. We'll see you all next time on Coco Talk. Marsha, what are you doing? Spring cleaning. Where'd you even get this stuff? In there. I've never seen you wear any of it. Well, for some reason, floating around in hot cocoa all day, I never get cold. It's Coco Talk. Today's guest, Stone, the Super Slam Rockwell, with a message about miracles. And our friend Fruitcake with exercise tips. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Happy Easter, everyone! Before we get to our hard-hitting interview, Stone the Super Slam Rockwell has challenged me to see if I can roll him over. Ooh, what do you get if you move him? I get to pick the music for the end of the show. But if I can't roll him over, then he chooses one of your songs? Do you really have your own music? Oh yeah, rock and roll. Amazing. Okay, let's do this. Are you ready to roll, Fruitcake? Okay, in three, two, one. Oh, no, no, no. 
Well, that does look like a challenge. It is. I could use a miracle right about now. Oh, oh, you know what you remind me of, Mr. Stone, the Super Slam? Can they call you just Stone? You remind me of the big stone they put in front of Jesus' tomb when they buried him after he died on the cross. It was really hard to move, too. But when Jesus' friends went to see him, the stone was rolled away. <clears throat> How did they move it? Asking for a friend. They didn't move it. And if you think that's amazing, get this. Jesus wasn't there. <laughs> Oh, that's right. The Bible says Jesus' friends found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they looked inside, they didn't find him there. Yep, Jesus had risen. That was the biggest miracle. He was alive again and is still alive today. That is amazing. You think you're amazed? After Jesus' friends left, they saw him walking along the road. They were so surprised. Jesus had risen. He had risen indeed. Are you okay? Maybe we should roll to a clip. Oh, right. Rolling! Whoa, you're really rolling. That's rock and roll if I ever saw it. Looks like we'll be hearing that Marcia song after all, Mr. Stone. Tell us, what's the secret for getting you to roll? Oh, man, we're out of time. Thanks for being here, Stone the Super Slam. And Fruitcake, appreciate you reffing. We really wanted to hear about your exercise routine. See you all next time on Coco Talk. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened to my song? Credit, gravel, towards a lot of stone. Gravel, pebbles, tough and soapstone. Kids, we were just talking about love. Oh yeah, it's just that time of year where you celebrate Christmas love. Hey, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Alanga? I do not understand. Uh, Alaska? I do not understand. Uh, whatever your name is. And you know what else is one? <laughs> whoa, whoa, <laughs> mittens! <laughs> what are you doing in my branches? <laughs> That tickles! That tickles! <laughs> Mittens! Get out of there! <laughs> okay, okay, I give, I give. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I love you too, Mittens. I do. You know what else I love? Christmas! Christmas is just the best time of year. You get all these presents. Hey, it's a long way down. You sure you want to do this, kid? See the world! Live life to the fullest! My fears! Let's do this! Alright. <laughs> Bombs away. Whee! So, you've decided to skydive. Congratulations! You're living life to the fullest. Freely flying through the clouds without a care in the world. And floating through the sky. And also plummeting to your doom. Don't worry, this shouldn't take long. Terminal velocity should bring you in contact with the Earth in about 60 seconds. No! What's that? You don't want to become a flattened mess when you hit the ground? You want to live? Well then, you better do something quick. Maybe flapping your arms with all your might will help. No luck there. How about closing your eyes and pretending you're back at home in your warm bed? Oh, so warm and cozy. Maybe this is all a dream. Nope, you're still falling. Well, it seems there's simply nothing you can do on your own that will change the gravity of the situation. Are you trying to be funny? <laughs> Just trying to lighten the mood. Say, do you have anything in your pockets that can help you? Nope, that won't work. Oh my. Really? There's only one thing to keep you from crashing into the planet. Hey kid, you forgot your parachute.
I'm saved! John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Even though it might not feel like it, God tells us in the Bible that we're in trouble. And just like how you need a parachute to save you from a free fall, we need Jesus to save us from our sins. Trust Jesus just like you would a parachute. When you do, the Bible says you'll be saved and you never have to worry about the consequence of sin. That's it for now. Mailbag. Welcome to Mailbag, where I read the questions that you guys have sent in. Okay, let's see what we've got here. If you were a superhero, what powers would you have? Let's see, hmm. Well, if I could run really fast, that would be cool. Definitely wouldn't have to worry about being late for class. Or the power to gain knowledge by sleeping with a textbook under my pillow? Oh man, I would know so many things and I wouldn't have to study. But I'd probably just sleep with comic books under my pillow. Either way, I'd be super rested. Dear Micah, do you like meatballs? Well, I, uh... <gasps> I was a meatball once! Oh, hi, Gabe. And you were a star, and then you weren't a star, and then we sang a song about meatballs, and I sang flat, and it was terrible. Oh, you know what else I like? Well, to answer spaghetti. your question, and, and I'm not crazy about meatballs. And meatballs. But the spaghetti was sardines, and the meatballs were all... Of... Oh, boy. I'm hungry. Dear Micah, what's your favorite Bible story? I really like the story of David and Goliath. Oh, I like that one too! When the big giant was mocking God and little David heard it and was like, Oh, no, you didn't! And then the king was like, Hey, little guy, put this on! And David was like, Oh, that's too big! So he went out to fight the giant and he won using only a slingshot! Wow! What a story! Yeah, that's the one. I like that one because it shows us that when we rely on God's strength and not our own, we can overcome giants that seem impossible to beat. It's like what Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 26. With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So you mean to tell me that with God's help, I can stuff 100 marshmallows in my mouth and say chubby bunny? I don't think that's what it means. Anyway, I think it's time to look at some fan art. Wow! Hey, that's me. Look at all these pictures. Oh, wow, that's a cool one. I like your colors. Oh, look, there's Chet. Hang on, Gabe. Didn't you forget something? Oh, right. I forgot radishes. Yum! Uh, no. He means you didn't say grace. You know, like prayer. I'm confused. How do I pray for a sardine sandwich? Why would God want to hear about that? Can I talk to God about anything? Should I book an appointment? Do I need a megaphone? Should I do a fancy cartwheel wearing a funny hat? Can I pray to God even when I'm singing flat? Don't worry about it, Gabe. It's easy. Yeah, no sweat. You whoa, don't need whoa. to spin around till your stomach gets upset. You don't need to read a script. Or speak with fancy words. God hears what's in your heart. So tell him your concerns. You can pray for those you love, like your friends and your family. But don't stop there. You can pray for your ah. enemy. Anytime is fine to bring your problems big and small. Give each and every one to him. God cares for, for them all. all. Pray. Because he's listening. Even when when you're whispering, pray. He'll give you peace within. Pray, 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 pray. pray, pray. Any time or place. In each and every case. Pray to, to help, help you run the race. race. Pray, 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 pray. Now that I know that praying is easy, I'm going to pray to God about everything. I'm going to pray to God for everything. When the milk's expired, toast on fire, I gotta be sting. When it's early in the morning or in the afternoon, I know God will hear my voice even underneath the moon. There's no oxygen. No one can hear you. God can! Pray! It'll help you grow. Pray when the answer's no. Oh. Pray. Trust the Lord, he knows. Pray. Pray, 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 pray. When you sing a song, pray. pray. When the loading's long, pray. pray. When you spell it wrong, pray. Pray, 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 pray. 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 When you're feeling small, pray. pray. With your favorite mug, pray. Pray, 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 pray. 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 
Ephesians 6.18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In Jesus' name, Amen! Mailbag! Welcome back to another episode of Mailbag, where I read the questions that you guys have sent in. If you had to choose between being a sock or a chair, which would you be? Interesting question. Well, the good thing about being a sock is that they come in pairs. So I definitely would have someone to talk about how smelly our owner's feet were. At least until one of us got lost in the laundry. But maybe that would be better than someone's butt in my face all the time. No! So I would say sock. Fiona asks, who is your best friend in the whole wide world? Oh, that's an easy answer. It's obviously me. I mean, I'm cool, we have all the same hobbies, Hold and... Hold on. What makes you so sure about that? I help Micah with his homework, I keep him out of trouble, and I'm overall a better influence on his character, which makes me the better friend. Better influence? <laughs> well, I'm more fun. Well, I'm hey more... now, there's no need to argue. You're both my best friends. <sighs> Yeah, yeah right. right. What do you mean, yeah, right? Come on, Micah. We all know you can't have more than one best friend. So which one is it, Micah? <laughs> Me or Lydia? Well, um, uh, my best friend is, well, uh, Jesus. Oh, that is not come fair. on. That's the Sunday school answer. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. John 15, verse 12 to 15 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus laid down his life for us and took our sins away. I think that makes Jesus the best friend you could ask for. Plus, he can walk on water, raise the dead, make the blind see, the deaf hear. Okay, okay, we get it. Jesus is pretty cool. That seems like a legitimate answer. Now that we've got that sorted out, I'm wondering... Who's your second best friend? It's me. No, I'm the second best friend. I'm the most secondest best friend there is! I'm nicer. I'm cooler. I'm smarter. I think it's I've got time glasses. to see some That's fan art. Count for something. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I can do a handstand. Whoa. That's a cool drawing. Hey, that's me. Me. That's cool. Wow. And now, Dennis raps about sandwiches. My name is Dennis, and I like to say I eat lots of sandwiches every day. Ham, salami, roast beef and pastrami, turkey veal meatloaf, Reuben and bologna, PLT, grilled cheese, chicken and a deli, chicken panini, I like salad is okay, pepperoni and cheese, PB and J, tuna, sandwiches. That was Dennis raps about sandwiches. Mailbag. Welcome back to another episode of Mailbag. Let's get into it, shall we? Stephanie asks, what's your favorite food? Easy one. My favorite food is pizza. Does someone say food? I'm assuming there's sandwiches nearby. Uh, there's no sandwiches here. Well, that's disappointing. I should probably stick around, you know, just in case some sandwiches show up. Okay, next question. Lucas asks, what's your favorite meal of the day? Ah. Okay, another food one. I think lunch is my favorite. Unless the lunch lady is serving that green mush that kind of smells like sweaty socks. Ugh, I still don't know what it is. What about you, Dennis? See, that's a trick question. How can you compare breakfast to lunch? On one hand, you have breakfast, bacon egg sandwich, lunch, turkey bacon sandwich, and dinner, bacon club sandwich, with extra bacon. It's bacon wrapped apples and oranges, really. Boy, am I hungry. Do you like Brussels sprouts? Yuck. Yuck! I'm still hungry though. Are you sure you don't have meat and cheese stuck between two slices of bread? Sorry, no. But that reminds me of a verse I read recently. John 6.35 says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now that sounds like some good bread. Sure does. Jesus is saying that just like bread, when we come to him, he will fill us up and give us what we need to keep going. Hmm, that's a good point. When I'm hungry, which is pretty much all the time, I have some bread, and I definitely feel better. Plus, I can't make a good sandwich without bread. I mean, it's the bread that holds everything together. Without it, things just fall apart. Exactly, Dennis. I think you just shared a great lesson on how Jesus works in our lives. Oh, I did? Well, uh, I mean, of course I did. I wasn't talking about sandwiches at all. Uh, why don't we, uh, why don't we check out some fan art? Wonderful. Hey, that's very cool. Great job. If you would like to send me your question, send me an email at michaelsuperblog.com. That's it for now. See you next time. Here's a quick story in a form of a rhyme. About a Nazarene who turned water into wine. I'm the bread of life, Jesus said. Disciples stood confused, scratching their heads. When it comes to life, you need more than food. Something even better, that's, that's the gospel, gospel truth. truth. You need the Son of God. The King of Kings, who lived a perfect life and died for your sins. But don't you worry, he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave, now you can have some bread! Of life. So come to Jesus, he'll make you whole. Fill your cup and, and feed, feed your, your soul. Word. Word. Ah! Mailbag. Welcome back to another episode of Mailbag, where I read the questions that you guys have sent in. Dear Micah, what do you like most about having your very own vlog? Thanks for your question, Levi. Um, I think what I like most about having a vlog is being able to say what's on my mind and share it with all of you. Hey, baby! What are you doing? Reading your baby diary? It's not a diary. I'm reading mail from my fans. Ha! You have fans? You should see my fan mail. There are thousands of Hans fans. Uma! Bring me the fan mail. Dispensing mail. Look, my guy, how much mail I have! <laughs> Hans, are you okay? Performing Heimlich. Oh, thank you, Uva. You will always be my Edelweiss. Um, on to the next question. Dear Micah, what's your favorite verse? Let's see. Hmm. Oh, I know. Right now, my favorite verse would have to be Luke 9, verse 25. What good is it if someone gains the whole world, but loses or gives up their very self? Now, I don't know if you know this, but at school, I'm not very popular. You got that right. You are what is called a dweeb. See what I mean? And you don't have the very latest in fashion clothes like me. Okay, okay, we get the point. When I read this verse, it helps remember being popular isn't what's important. What do you mean? Being popular is everything! Do I have to remind you how much mail I have? What I mean is, when we focus only on fame and popularity, we can forget that our relationship with God is the most important thing of all. Well, you do that, and I'll focus on all of my mail from my adoring Hans Fons! Just don't choke on the envelope again. I've got so much mail! <coughs> Why does this keep happening? Um... I think it's time to see some fan art. So beautiful. Oh, the color is so vibrant. I love me. Oh, look at this. Oh, they got the hair so good. If you would like to send me your question, send me an email at mikeasuperblog.com. That's it for now. See you next time. Hans Fons! Hans Fons! Welcome to Hans Fans, where all my adoring fans send me mail, because I'm the best. Dear Hans, you are so smart and rich and have cool things, and everybody wants to be like you because you are so cool. Love, Hansel. P.S. This isn't from yourself, a.k.a. Hans. P.S. P.S. You have nice hair. Ah, well, that was very nice of you, Hans. I mean, Hansel. I agree with all that you said. Next question. Guess what? Chicken butt. What? What? Who wrote this? <laughs> Why you? Hans Fons! Hans Fons! This has gone to your head. Remember, pride always comes before the fall. Whatever. Have you ever read the story of King Nebuchadnezzar? He was so full of pride, he even built a statue of himself. You're just jealous. And besides, it's not like I'm making a big statue of myself. 
One big statue of self for, uh, Mr. Micah Superstar. You know, people who think too highly of themselves sometimes do some pretty crazy things. Just like King Nebba, Nobbly, Nebble, Nibble some scissors. That's King Nebuchadnezzar. Medical sweater? Nebuchadnezzar. Let's just call him Nebby for short. Have you heard of King Nebuchadnezzar? It's a story of a man who thought no one could be better with his heart full of pride. He never saw it odd that it's wrong to ask people to treat you like your god. He thought highly of himself and said, what could be better than to build a big statue of King Nebuchadnezzar? He said, bow to my statue to his people in all earnest. If you fail to bow down, you'll be thrown in a furnace. But Shadrach, Meshach, and the Ben to go, refuse to bow down to the statue made of gold. What? Are you mad? You will bow to my statue? Nebby said, you can run, but you know we will catch you. We won't run. They replied, we, we have, have nothing to fear. We know God will save us. And our conscience will be clear. We won't worship you or your gods or anything. anything. No God but our God, and that is that, oh, oh Nebby King. King. Fine, tie them up, turn the furnace up to seven. seven. Throw them in the fire, see if help comes from heaven. Now before you all say this story isn't fair, shouldn't God save his people when they bow to him in prayer? Well, God showed up, made the people all stare. They looked into the furnace and saw four people there. Their jaws all fell and their eyes grew wide. Nebis said, oh, look, the son of God's inside. Come out of the furnace. Your God must be real. Yeah. The three members. Hey, I, I, got, I got a rap too. My name is Dennis and I like to eat sandwiches. And what, it's the song over already? Well, that's it. He pops. Hey, what? Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Uh, who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. 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 Who's there? Banana who? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange? Orange who? Orange, you glad I didn't say banana? Oh, <laughs> I am glad. <laughs> Hey, Pop! Yep? What does a cloud wear under his raincoat? Well, I don't know. Thunderwear. Thunderwear. <laughs> <laughs> that one's the best one. Hey, Pop! Hey, what? Knock, knock. Who's there? Fig. Figs who? Fig the doorbell that's not working. Figs the doorbell. <laughs> Hey, Peanut. Yeah? What do you call a boomerang that won't come back? What? A stick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pop. Hey, what? Um, what happens if you tell a joke to an Easter egg? I don't know. What? It cracks up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Hey, what? Why did the cow cross the road? I don't know. Why? Because he wanted to get to the movie feeder. Get it? Moo? And a feeder? <laughs> movie feeder. <laughs> That's hey, Pop. Hey, what? What can you always count on? I don't know. What? Your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I don't even have fingers. I don't know. What? A smell of it. 
<laughs> hey, Peanut. Hey, what? Knock, knock. Who's there? Jess. Jess who? Just open the door and let me in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. How? They have lots of fans. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Peanut. Hey, what? Knock, knock. Who's there? Garden. Garden who? Garden the treasure. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pop. Hey, what? Where do people learn to make ice cream? I don't know. Where? Sunday school. <laughs> hey, Pop. Hey, what? What are the baby corn say to the mama corn? I don't know. What? Where's popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Pops. <laughs> hey, Peanut. Hey, what? What did the salt say to the pepper? Hey, what's shaking? <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, Pops. Hey, what? What do snowmen do on a weekend? Uh, I don't know. What? They chill. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pops. Hey, what? What the turkey said to the computer? Oh, I have no idea. Go, 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 go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pops! Hey, what? Why is it called at Christmas? I don't know. Why? Because it's December. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Peanut. Hey, what? Knock, knock. Who's there? Yeah. Yahoo. Yahoo? Wow, you're really excited about Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Hey, Peanut. Hey, what? How do you get a squirrel to like you? I don't know. How do you get a squirrel to like you? Act like a nut. <laughs> hey, Pops. Hey, what? How do we know the ocean is friendly? I don't know. How do we know the ocean is friendly? It waves. <laughs> Hi, ocean. Hey, Pop. Hey, what? What is a cat's favorite church song? I don't know. What is a cat's favorite church song? Yes, Jesus loves me. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Pops. Hey, what? What do you call a funny mountain? Hmm. I don't know. What do you call a funny mountain? Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pops. Hey, what? Where do fish keep their money? I don't know. Where do fish keep their money? In a river bank. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Pops! Hey, what? What kind of haircut do bees get? Mm, I have no idea what haircuts bees like to get. They get buzz cuts. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Peanut. Hey, what? Why did the banana go to the doctor? I don't know. Why did the banana go to the doctor? Because it wasn't... Feeling well. <laughs> hey, Peanut. Hey, what? What job did Noah want before he built the ark? I don't know. What job did Noah want before he built the ark? He wanted to be an architect. <laughs> hey, Pops. Hey, what? What did the volcano say to the other volcano? Hmm, 
I don't know. What did the volcano say to the other volcano? I love you. <laughs> We're not going to make it, Captain. The gravity is too great. Failure is not an option. We need more power. We've got no more power. I'm giving it everything. It's not enough. Looks like our final mission, Captain. It's been nice serving with you. No, there must be another way. <gasps> the bathroom's on the utility deck. You gotta go? No, divert the power from the bathrooms to the main engines. It just might be enough. It's crazy, but I've taken power from everywhere else. Oh, come on. <laughs> That extra boost was just what we needed. Oh, Captain Buck, you're a genius. Congratulations, uh, Captain what? Buck. Oh, uh, Pastor Paul. I don't know how you did it, but you're the first starship on record to escape a wormhole. We just needed to use the bathroom. I'm not sure what that means, but not only have you done something never done before, as of this mission, you, Buck Denver, have successfully brought the good news of Jesus to the entire galaxy. Well, I guess so. <laughs> you have saved the galaxy! Buck! 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 Oh, Buck! really? Buck! There was nothing. Buck! Buck! Back. No, back. stop, back. stop, back. no. Back. Oh, back. come on. It was no big deal. Back. <laughs> back. Wait, what? Back. Where am I? You were daydreaming again and not answering your phone. You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, a ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? Hmm? Out in space again? Yeah. Best save your dreaming for after work. We got phones to answer. You reach Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, the Ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? You reach Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, the Ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. How can I help you? You haven't received your tote bag? I can see why you're upset. I'd like to thank you for supporting our ministry, and I apologize for the delay in receiving your promotional item. Send through your name and address, and I'll get that tote bag right on its way. All right, bye now. I can't keep doing this. What? You don't like the Gospel Galaxy program anymore? Pastor Paul's great. He's making a big difference. It's me. I'm not doing any good at all. You just got a lady a tote bag. A tote bag she will enjoy for years to come. A tote bag to one lady. What's the problem? Buck doesn't think he's doing any good. But he got a lady a tote bag. Well, that's pretty good. It's not. It's nothing. Buck, what's going on? Ever since I was a little kid, I dreamed about doing something big for God, like Billy Graham or Pastor Paul. Well, you know, some people are big things, people. And other people answer the phones and send out tote bags. But I don't want to be a tote bag guy. I want to be a big thing guy. <gasps> your phone is ringing. Are you standing on your desk? Maybe. That's your phone. You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul. A ministry of blah, blah, blah. How may I help you? The signal's out? When did it happen? Two days ago? And where are you? Sector 9, Quadrant 7. Thanks for calling. We'll put a team right on it. There's a whole quadrant that can't hear Pastor Paul. Must be a bad transponder. Put in a tech request. That could take weeks. We can't wait that long. I gotta go to the boss. Wait. Pastor Paul? This is big, bigger than tote bags! Uh, sir? Yes, what is it? 
It appears we have a transponder down in Sector 9, Quadrant 7, sir. Well, put in a tech request. Yes, but that could take weeks. And there's a whole quadrant of people who can't hear your program, who aren't learning about God. Who are you? Buck Denver, sir, from the call center. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Buck Denver, from the call center. But our two repair crews are both out in the field. We have a third ship, but no crew available. It will have to wait. Well, you probably don't know this, sir, but I've been training to be a ship's captain in my spare time. I've taken all the classes online in conjunction with an app on my phone. You're learning to be a deep space captain with an app? It's amazing what you can do with apps these days. All I've left is the final exam, a real mission, under supervision, of course. So this could be my, uh, you know, final exam. Let me see if I'm getting this. You are to put together your own crew, take a ship you've never piloted into deep space, fix the transponder, and have it count as your final exam for your captain's license. Yeah. I know it's kind of weird, but, but, God wants us to do big things, sir. Nothing against tote bags, but, but this is what God wants me to do. Bring his word to all the people of Sector 9, Quadrant 7. I just need a chance. Hmm, well, even if I were to say yes, I have no one to supervise you. All the crews are in the field. I think I have someone in mind, if it's not too crazy. Oh, Buck, that's absolutely insane. You have plenty of experience in space. But I haven't flown a mission in 17 years. It's like riding a bike. You never forget. I've never been in deep space. Back in my day, we weren't allowed to go past Neptune. It's all made of the same stuff. Uh, space stuff? <sighs> God wants us to do big things, and I've been wasting my time with tote bags. Well, this is my chance. This is it. Oh, Buck, I'm not sure. For me? I don't know. For God? Oh. For the people of Sector 9, Quadrant 7? <laughs> We're going to space! What are you talking about? All of us. We're going to space to fix that transponder. You can fix a transponder, right? You guys are handy. We fixed a blender once. Same idea. But who's going to be captain? Me! Don't worry, I've been taking classes on my phone. Pastor Paul says it's okay. Sunday school lady's coming along to supervise. <gasps> and when we're finished, I'll be a captain for real. It's sort of like a field trip. Yeah, to an alien planet. What could possibly go wrong? Ships nowadays are so automated, there's very little that could really go wrong. You see, guys? Just like I've been saying. Good heavens, they've gone metric. The buttons are different. It's all automated. You'll hardly have to push any. I hope I get to push some. What's the point of going to space if you can't push any buttons? Oh dear. I'm patching in one of our engineers to talk through your mission. All right, you're on a transponder repair mission. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. See, I told you. The transponder in question is on the planet Talaris, Sector 9, Quadrant 7. Is that a nice planet? Most importantly, it's an uninhabited planet. No one lives there, so you shouldn't have any trouble. Well, that's a relief. You'll follow the beacon to the transponder unit. Talaris is a volcanic planet. Most likely, seismic activity knocked the polyneutronic power rod out of alignment. You'll realign it, get the unit back up and running, and then head home. <laughs> Oh, Talaris does have some nasty sandstorms, so watch out for those. But no inhabitants. Nope, not according to our sensors. Are your sensors ever wrong? Hardly ever. Uh, 
on the outside chance that they were wrong, uh, that we did bump into some inhabitants, um, what should we do? Oh, that's easy. It's easy, see? Run. Huh? Uh, well, gotta get back to work. Enjoy! Did he say run? I haven't run since 1998. No one's going to have to run because this planet is uninhabited. That's what the sensors say. And they're hardly ever not very often wrong. Only occasionally. Oh, come on, guys. God wants us to do big things. This is a big thing. So this is what God wants us to do. And since God wants us to do this, he'll make sure nothing goes wrong. Are you sure that's how that works? It's on my poster. So fire up the engines and let's get moving. We've been moving this whole time. It's highly automated. In fact, we're just about ready to make our hyper jump to Sector 9. Quadrant 7. All right, hyper jump on my mark. Five, four, three. Too late. The ship's already made the decision. time we should put on our seat belts before we hyper jump. Don't look at me. It was the ship. Uh, that must be Tolaris. It took us right there without pressing a button. But I wanted to press buttons. I wanted to press lots of buttons. Can we go back and do it again? No way. We're here. It's time to do something big to the shuttle. This place is really red. It's iron oxide, just like Mars. Why didn't we just go to Mars? It's a lot closer. That's not where the transponder is, Ian. Oh, right. Where is the transponder? We're tracking its beacon. The shuttle will set us down a couple hundred yards away. It sure doesn't look like anyone lives here. The sensors were right. It is uninhabited. All right, everyone, we're setting down. Hmm, according to the beacon, the transponder is this way. No, wait. That way! Are we really following him? It would appear so. Doing something big for God. I hope he knows what he's getting us into. No one lives here, right? The planet is completely uninhabited. Yes, but does anybody live here? Do you know what the word uninhabited means? Not exactly. It means no one lives here. Oh, good. So no one lives here? Is that the transponder? No, the transponder unit is still about 50 yards away. Over there! See? We made it! If that's the transponder unit, what's that? It is a door, and on the door it says TU, transponder unit. And it's covered with scratches, and the hinges have been pried right off. Wait. The hinges were pried off? That means... Run! Wait, where are you going? Someone or something ripped that door right off its hinges! This planet is not uninhabited, Buck. That means it's time to run! <laughs> Wait, it was probably just seismic activity. Buck, earthquakes don't rip doors off and throw them 50 yards. There are creatures on this planet, which means we need to get off of it. <laughs> oh, well, you don't have to throw sand at me. I didn't throw sand at you. Ow! 
It's a sandstorm, just like the said. What? Oh, man. Come on! Back to the shuttle! But we're so close! The transponder is right there! God wants us to do big things. Remember my poster? It's too risky, Buck. They'll send another crew to fix the transponder. And I'll go back to handing out tote bags? Not gonna happen. God wants me to do big things, and I'm gonna do big things. Buck, come back. It's too dangerous, Buck. I can't believe he's doing this. We'll never find him in this storm. Let's wait it out in the shuttle and find Buck when it's all over. We'll be back for you, Buck. There it is. I'm gonna realign the poly whatever power rod and get the transponder back online. Pastor Paul will be impressed. God will be impressed. I'll be doing big things for him. Okay, this is easy. Just need emergency power so I can see what I'm doing. Here we go. Ooh, good. Now, where's the power supply? Oh, here it is. See? No problem. Just realign the power rod. Uh, wait, where is it? The seismic activity must have knocked it right out. It's a glowing tube. Should be easy to spot. Hmm? Better idea. Security cameras record everything. They'll show me where the power source fell. Just play the last thing that was recorded? Aha! Uh -huh. An earthquake! The seismic activity! <laughs> that wasn't seismic activity. That definitely wasn't seismic activity. This planet is not uninhabited! Hmm? What's that? Hmm? Who's there? Is that you, Sunday School Lady? <laughs> I don't get it. The shuttle should be right in front of us. If we didn't take any wrong turns in the storm, which is very possible... We should have borrowed Buck's location tracker before we let him run off. The next time. We'll definitely do that next time. Yes, next time. Wait, I see something. That must be the shuttle. It's getting closer, but I'm not moving. What? What? Where? Hey, what? Huh? Um, hello? Clive? Ian? Sunday school lady? Uh, um, is someone there? Uh, Marcy? Is that you? Uh, definitely not Marcy. Oh, dear Lord, help me. I was just trying to do something big for you. I didn't want to be eaten by an alien creature. Well, call me a smurgeon fern. You're from Earth, aren't you? I am. I am. Don't eat me. I'm nothing but head. <laughs> Heavens to Tarblin. I'm not going to eat you, Earthman. No matter how many times I patch that hole, things just keep falling through. And now an Earthman. Well, let's turn on some light and have a look at you. Yeah, 
Earth, you are old head, aren't you? What do they call you, big headed Earth man? I'm Buck. Buck Denver. Buck, Buck Denver. Just one Buck. Oh, I prefer Buck Buck. Why so far from home? All alone. I'm not alone. I've got a crew. Uh, well, I did. I'm on a mission to fix the transponder so Sector 9 Quadrant 7 can hear Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul. <gasps> oh, Gospel Galaxy, my favorite show. Wait, you listen to the show? Sure do. I got a tote bag around here somewhere. Until last week when the signal just fizzled away. I know, and I'm here to fix it, and then finally I'll be doing something big for God and I'll become a captain, and my life will really matter. <sighs> At least that's what was supposed to happen. Until everything went wrong, the door was ripped clean off, and there was a sandstorm, and my crew ran off, and it wasn't seismic activity, it was scary aliens, because this planet isn't uninhabited like it was supposed to be, and I'm just trying to do something big like God wants. <sighs> I'm doing my part. Why isn't he doing his? Hey, why'd you... What's that? It's my tote bag. Pick it up. Come with me. Didn't you hear what I said? I'm trying to do what God wants, but it's all falling apart. You're a follower of Jesus, right? You mean a Christian? I am. But how do you know about Jesus? Missionaries came to my home planet, Jowin. They told me about Jesus. That's why I'm here. You're in a cave because of Jesus? Exactly. Brace yourself. What? Ah! What'd you do that for? Pick up your bag. Why are we beating up plants? Why am I holding this bag? When I started walking with Jesus, he led me here. First, just to be with him. Focus on him. Get to know him. Uh, hold the bag right there. And now he's given me a garden to tend. You mean these plants were beating up? Uh, not exactly. Uh, it's a different sort of garden. Whoa! Oh, for heaven's sake, hang on to the bag. And this is the big thing God has given you to do? Beating up plants in a cave? Tell me, Buck Buck Denver, how do you know God wants you to do big things? Everyone knows that. Everyone? Well, it's on my poster. Your poster? Yeah, see? God wants you to do big things. It's right there. That's why he made us, to do stuff for him, to save the world. Can I make one small change to your poster? I guess, but be careful, because it's very special. Hey, my poster! Why you? That's better. What? God wants you... I need the other half. No, you don't. But this doesn't say anything. That says exactly what you need to hear, Buck Buck. God wants you. Wants me to what? He doesn't want you to do anything. He just wants you. Wants me? He wants to be with you. He loves you, Buck Buck, not because of what you can do, just because he made you. As a matter of fact, he loves you even when you aren't doing anything at all. Follow me. We've got a garden to tend. Wait. Is this your garden? Not exactly. Tell me, Buck Buck, this dream, this big thing you were trying to do for God, was it bringing you joy, making you happy? Was it bringing your friends joy? Well, not exactly. But who says I'm supposed to be happy? I'm saving the world. I'll be happy when I've done something big. And the fruit of the Spirit is peace.
joy, love. That's the Apostle Paul talking, Buck Buck. In the New Testament, if we're filled with the Spirit, walking with Jesus, we'll be filled with peace, filled with love, filled with joy, not later, not after we've done something big. But I don't... Your problem is you don't know what you are. I'm a big-headed earth man. Yeah, yeah. I mean your true nature. We need to take a little ride. What? In there? After you. I was like you once, Buck Buck. I thought God needed me to save the world. I thought I could save the world, that I had the power, if only I worked hard enough. So I worked hard, so hard it almost killed me, so hard it made me miserable. I thought I was a Baruba. Oh, what? It's a Jowan fish, big, strong, fast. You don't mess with a Baruba. Like a shark back on Earth. Right, a shark. God shark. That's what I thought I was. If you aren't a shark, what are you? A whale? A barracuda? A swordfish? A gloon. A gloon? Push that button. Release the seeds into the water. Are we feeding something? Push it. I don't see anything. Give it a second. Whoa, is that a gloon? We Earthlings call those jellyfish. Jellyfish, I like that name too. Gloon, or jellyfish, can't choose their own course. They can't go anywhere or accomplish anything on their own. Well, what's the point of that? A gloon is carried by the current. It must trust the current to take it where it needs to be. Push that button again. Hold it down. And so are we. And so are you. But only when we're trusting the current. And the current is? God's will. God's love. God's plan for us. When we let go of our goals, our desires, our dreams, and just focus on God walking with Jesus, the current of his heart carries us along. My life is no longer mine to worry about. God has my life suspended in the current of his love. Like a gloon. Like a jellyfish. I'm not a shark. You are not a shark. And pretending you are only hurts yourself and the people around you. God isn't asking you to do big things. He's asking you to be with him. Trust him. Rest in him. The people around me. My crew. I gotta go find my crew. I was so worried about my dream that I left them in a sandstorm. Do you have a radio? I do. Let's get you closer to the surface and we'll ring them up. I'm sure they're all right. <laughs> I'm ringing up the shuttle. They should be there, but they're not. Where else could they be? Um, Talaris isn't exactly uninhabited, you know. Oh, no. I think I know where you'll find them. I'll give you directions. Wait, can't you come with me? It's time to try walking with Jesus for yourself, Buck Buck Denver. But I haven't learned enough. I just found out I'm a glue, not a Baruba, like three minutes ago. You'll keep learning your whole life long, and I'll help. Here, 
take this. What is this? A deep space communicator. This one and its linked pair can open up a channel no matter how far apart they are. But only for a couple minutes a day. I've got the linked pair. You take this one. All right. I guess I'm ready to go. But how am I going to know what to do when I'm following Jesus? Is he going to tell me everything? As you learn to hear his voice, he'll tell you some things, but not everything. When in doubt, use the rule of love. Is that where I hug everybody? No, unless they need a hug. The rule of love is simply to put others first. If God puts someone in your path that you can help, help them. It's that simple? It's that simple. If God puts someone in my path that I can help, help them. The rule of love. All right, I'll give it a try. Now you better get going. Your friends are probably in a pretty tight spot. We're in a pretty tight spot. I'll say we are. We're in a cage. Hanging in the air. Over all lava. Surrounded by angry aliens. I think this qualifies as a tight spot. How did we get here exactly? Oh yes, I remember. Buck Denver. Let's have an adventure. Do big things for God. It's my dream. And now he's run off, and we're gonna be deep fried by E.T. Oh, to be answering phones again. Sending out tote bags. Verifying credit card numbers. What's that alien have? It's glowing. It's the power rod from the transponder. That's what Buck is out there looking for. It looks like the aliens are worshipping it. I wonder if we'll ever see Buck again. I'm pretty sure we will. How do you know? Because he's right there. Hi, Buck! Don't blow his cover! Oh, um... My, what luck! Why should I duck? Where's my truck? Stop it, they don't even speak English. I don't need this. God doesn't want me to do big things. He just wants me to walk with him. And I found my friends. I can rescue them. But maybe God wants me to have both. Now that I've given up my dream, maybe he wants to give it back. That'd be just like God. I can walk with him and have my dream. <sighs> Hey! <laughs> what is going on down there? Oh, Buck, what are you doing? <laughs> Let it go, Buck. Give me my dream back! <laughs> Hang on! No! I can get it! No, Black! I can get it! It's my dream. God wants me to do big things. No, Buck. God wants you. The current is God's love, God's heart. Trust the current. How will I know what to do? The rule of love. 
If God puts someone in your path who needs help, help them. to be off that planet and headed home. It was great how you saved that alien. Right, and us too. I'm sorry we couldn't complete the mission, Buck. I know being a captain was your dream. You know, I'm a gloon, not a baruba. Oh, uh, what? I'm a jellyfish, not a shark. A new friend taught me that drifting in the current of God's will, letting him choose my course, is better than any dream I could ever come up with. That's the wisest thing I've ever heard you say, Buck. Wait, when did you have time to make a new friend? I'll explain later. Let's head home. There's phones to answer and tote bags to send. Let me push the button. Too late. The ship did it. I don't like this ship at all. You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, a ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, a ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? Down the hall? Uh, who's calling? Pastor Paul? Do, do you need a tote bag? Oh, I'll be right there. It's me, Buck Denver. Uh, yes, I hear the mission was not a success. Uh, no, Tolaris is not uninhabited. I was not able to fix the transponder. I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. I don't need to be a captain unless God wants me to. I know that now. I have peace. And even a little joy for the first time. I knew Taloris wasn't completely uninhabited, for a very old friend lives there. You may have met him. Wait, what? I was the first missionary to a small planet called Jowen. I brought the stories of Jesus. You were that missionary? I still talk to him quite frequently. I can't believe this. Well, believe it or not, Regis spoke this morning and he believes you learned exactly what you needed to learn, Captain Buck Denver. I'm sorry, what did you say? We need leaders who follow God's heart, not their own. Who trust God's plans, not their own. We'll put together the crew you need and get you on your way. I've already got the crew I need. How do we look, people? All stocked and ready, Captain. Our new engineer disabled the autopilot so Ian can push the buttons. I am so ready to push a button. New engineer? First engineer Pete, at your service. Welcome aboard, engineer Pete. First mate Sunday school lady? Captain, our mission is logged and we're ready to fly. I'm proud of you, Buck. Jelly on. Jelly on. Wait, I didn't push the button. Oh, you wanted me to disable the autopilot now? Oh man, can we go back and do it again? Here, push this button. <laughs> can I do it again? Once is enough. What did I say? <laughs> that was fun. Do not touch it again. Ow, seatbelts first. 
first. So these people came to him and said, Didn't you just set a law that nobody could pray to the true God except you? And he said, Oh yes, okay, I'll do it. And, and then Daniel does that and he goes into the lion's den and, and he prayed and prayed and and Jesus sent an angel to shut half of the lions. And then lions, what is gross about them? They eat people. And Daniel and the Daniel's king woke up the next. There are stories in the Bible that are told when you're a child. But as soon as you're a grown-up, they no longer seem to show up. I guess grown-ups don't like action and they find no satisfaction. In these famous children's stories, do they think they are too boring? How about David and Goliath? There a stone took down a giant orphan. Jonah fled by sail, but was followed by a veil. And Noah's up, let's not forget a flood from God is kind of an hail. And the lions did say God is sturdy. They're not in our superheroes, as it's only cut his hair. Lots of dollar when the traffic all the blood on the fall. Here goes El Montrino and the rest of the show. So let's go. Back to the basics. Wow! Oh, was that supposed to be recording? What? Moses! Pods the Red Sea. Red Sea. It's blue water. Hello, boys and girls, and welcome back for another episode of Back to the Basics. As always, I have with me Gooba and Gertie, who are part of the TTT. That's the Time Traveling Trio. It's all so exciting. We are the first to travel back in time. This must be what Albert Einstein felt when he first introduced the theory of general relativity. <laughs> you mean Einstein. What? Well, you said Albert Einstein. It's actually Einstein. Ugh, Cuba. I think I know how to properly pronounce my childhood hero's name. Albert Einstein. Oh, well, that's not how his brother Frank pronounces it. Uh, Frank? Einstein? Frankenstein isn't Albert Einstein's brother. Albert Einstein was a real person. Dr. Frankenstein was a fictional character from a book. He wasn't real. Well, of course not. Thank you. Not until after the experiment. What? Pardon me, folks. Door was open, so I figured I'd just come on in and deliver this here package. Shook it a couple times on the way in, and I'm pretty sure it's broken. Although I did drop it, I'm almost positive it was broken before that. Think it broke when it fell off my bike. Oh, no. I totally forgot about her sponsorship. Before we closed down her social media accounts, Gertie got sponsored by Cat Treasures. 
it's a company that specializes in turning the chore of cleaning out kitty litter into a fun treasure hunt for kids. I think those were some of the prizes to hide in the litter box. That is just gross. Kinda glad I broke it now. <clears throat> Excuse me, but we have a... The name's Doofus, Doofus Rufus. Now, I know what you're thinking. Doesn't Doofus typically mean someone not very smart? Well, yes, which is why my birth name is Doofus, because my mama said, in my world, every day is opposite day, which means I am a genius. Like Albert Einstein. Is that Frank's brother? Exactly. Ugh. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the package, but you must be off. We have a show to finish. Hey, why are you wearing a life vest? This isn't a life vest. It's my P-F-D. Uh, what's a P-F-D? That, my friend, is called an algorithm. <coughs> Acronym. It means personal flotation device. Have you ever heard of a little lady named Katrina? How about a fine gentleman named Harvey? Do they work here? Those are the names of not one, but two hurricanes that hit the Gulf Coast. And guess where you live? In America? Which has a Gulf Coast, so... Any moment, a hurricane could hit you, bam, right out of nowhere. That's not how hurricanes work. One minute, you're just taking a stroll down a street, then the next moment, boom, you're covered in 50 feet of water. Well, guess who's floating right to the top of the water? This guy with the PFD. Oh, Professor, I don't have a PFD. Ugh. We have plenty of warning time before a hurricane hits, so there's no need to be scared. Now, can you please leave so we can finish our show? A show? Well, what kind of show are you making? We time travel. Ah, that's quite enough, Cuba. <laughs> ah, out you go. All right, all right, I'm going fine. Don't tell me what the show's about. I've got more packages to deliver anyway. It was nice to meet you. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you as well. Thank you, Rufus. No, no, Doofus, Rufus. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, finally. Now, there we are. Oh, Professor, do you think we're going to get caught in a hurricane? Gooba, you do not need to be afraid of a hurricane. We are told about incoming hurricanes days in advance, giving us plenty of time to prepare. Oh, I'm not afraid. It's, uh, it's Gertie. She's definitely worried. Ah, Gooba. Well, you see, God is in command of all things. Whether it is a raging hurricane or even a gentle breeze, God controls it all. Really? Of course. Did you know that there was a man that actually parted an entire sea through the power of God? What? That's incredible! His name was Moses! One of the greatest characters found in all the Bible. Gooba, I think we have just figured out who we're going to visit today. To the time machine! Checklist, set the timer for Moses. Check! Set the time machine for a chicken. I know, Gooba, that may seem crazy, but... It is one of the many domesticated animals that was most likely brought along when Moses led God's people out of Egypt. Check. Seatbelts. Check. I guess we both need to say this now. We, we will, will not, not intercede, intercede with, with the, the past. past. Well, that's surprising. You didn't say anything after that. Well, it's hard to. I don't know what intercede means. Ah, uh, well, let's go. Excited about seeing the parting of an entire body of water. <laughs> uh, Professor, why is everyone running around like chickens? Except, you know, all the chickens. Well, at the moment, the entire Egyptian army is behind Moses and the people of Israel. So they're scared because they're trapped between the army behind them and the Red Sea that is in front of them. 
but I thought you said Moses parts the Red Sea and they walk through. These people don't know that yet. It's only easy for us to know since we read the entire Bible. Well, it sounds like these people need to read the Bible more. Well, Gooba, we need to figure out where Moses is and maneuver closer to him. Let me see if I can locate... It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die here in the wilderness. Listen, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish today. For the Egyptians that you see, you shall see no more forever. Ah! Ah, we are headed straight for the crowd. Do you see this chicken? Although odd and shed of all of its feathers, plus a mind that seems to be slipping away, it's still ready to follow God's command. This one is totally on Gertrude. Gooba, we're ready about that when we get back. We must all be more like this chicken. So gather your things and get ready to move. <laughs> to where? Back towards the army? Or hey, oh, what about into the Red Sea? <laughs> Will you please get Gertrude back in her seat? <laughs> Ooh, finally, back under control. <gasps> Wait, I see Moses heading up the hill. He must be going to pray. We must go. Hurry up, Gooba. Hurry up. Oh, no, you don't, chicken. Let's get you back with the others. No! Of course this would happen. <laughs> Hello, Professor. I've got another package. Must have fallen off my bike before I delivered the last one. This one happens to be broken, too. Still not my fault, though. Just must be an entire batch of bad packages. Hello? Anyone there? But Einstein, we can't see anything. <laughs> Moses is probably up on the hill at this very moment, standing up after praying to God. He's lifting his staff and raising his hands towards the Red Sea with the power of God running through him. The very water listens to his command, splitting apart and creating a dry pass across the Red Sea and over to the other side. Maybe if we tip our coop over the side of the wagon, it'll break. Hold on! Ha! 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 Here we go! Woohoo! Uh, was your goal to make things worse? No! <laughs> Professor! Goober? You guys in here? I just need a signature for this broken package. I also need a signature for that last package. Must have forgot about that. Oh, and I'll need one more signature saying that I was not the one that broke them. Be right back, the TTT. -T -T. Well, what on earth does that mean? Why <sighs> didn't I pick something larger? Like, like, like a donkey. Oh, there are no donkey coops. Instead, I chose a chicken. And now we are stuck watching pigs, pigs of all things roll around in the mud. Ah, such majestic creatures. Oh God, why does it seem I always miss? All the important moments and I am left to dream and reminisce of things now left unknowing. Am I on the right path as I fumble along? Can you give me a sign if I'm doing this wrong? Stuck in a crate with some pigs. 
fish in a chicken I say Foul life streaming to kids Another story I miss <laughs> Oh God, to you I pray The professor, he doesn't seem okay And I would like to say something nice Make your pain go away But I ain't good with words They fumble out of my mouth Look at that baby pig He's got mud on his now Stuck in a prey with some boots Their cuteness I can resist Oh, wish I could give them a kiss But chickens do not have But wait, maybe I'm right to be here now. Look at his smile over the side. Oh, hey, I think he's good. He must have seen that piggy eating his food. I must be on the right path. No words did I need to say. Even showing up. Just the aftermath. And I did speak, they'd probably be wrong anyway. We owe it all to you. Thank you, God. Shall we do it in unison? What's unison? Cause we're stuck in a grave with some was a little bit too high. Whoa! We just rolled into a hallway. Maybe we're taking a bathroom break already. <sighs> Kids. We aren't going to pit stop all of these people, Gooba. What are you talking about? This isn't a hallway. It's a wall of water. We can actually see the fall of water! The mission is a success! <laughs> it is? Even if we're stuck in pig slap? I feel like I missed something. Well, our goal was to see how God is in control of all things, Gooba. In using the power of God, Moses just parted the Red Sea, and they're looking at it. Wait a second. These blue walls are the Red Sea. Where's the red? Honestly, people. We have got to get better at naming things. Let us be off! <gasps> they really are time traveling! <gasps> they must be robots from the future! Boys and girls, we made it. And so did Moses and God's people. They crossed the Red Sea on dry land, and as Pharaoh and his army tried to follow them, the path across the sea closed, helping them to escape. So, join us next time for another adventure on Back to the Basics. I think Gertie should be the one to clean off the pig slop from the time machine. She's a bird, Gooba. And a dunce bird at that. Okay, then you can. You chose chicken. What? My Gooba? I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm old. I can't hear what you're saying. Fine, I'll do it. Maybe I'll paint it blue and call it the red time machine. Sheriff's Department. Okay, listen to this. I have verified proof that our world is about to be taken over by, wait for it, robots from the future. They call themselves the T 
P-T. I need you to send a SWAT team, the police, a firefighter, an ambulance, an airplane, a helicopter, a submarine. Is that you, doofus? Uh, no. No, no, It's someone else. Someone really important. I'm so important, I can't tell you my name right now. Doofus, we already said you can't call here anymore. It's also your second robot invasion call. Technically, I could still be right about that first one. It only takes one refrigerator rising up and attacking its owner before that robot revolution starts. And then you will be calling me to apologize. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Goodbye, doofus. No, no, wait. I I said goodbye, doofus. (sighs) Well... I guess it's just up to me, then. Do you want to play hide and seek? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. When you're not, here we come. Hide and seek. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. Did you know two women showed up at the tomb where Jesus was buried? Three, one thousand. But Jesus had already risen from the dead in three days, just like he said. Four one thousand, and now we are four given. Five one thousand. Jesus also fed five thousand people once, but that's a story for another time. Six seven eight nine ten one thousand. Ready or not, he is risen. Indeed, you're it. Oh. <laughs> There are stories in the Bible that are told when you're a child. But as soon as you're a grown-up, they no longer seem to show up. I guess grown-ups don't like action and they find no satisfaction. In these famous children's stories, do they think they are too boring? How about David and Goliath? There a stone took down a giant oven. Jonah fled by sail, but was swallowed by a veil. And Noah's up, let's not forget a flood from God is kind of an angel. And the lions did say God is sturdy, did not in our superheroes. Has it's all he cut his hair, lots of dollar when the trumpet called him blood. Called the fall of your goals, yell more freedom, I'm the rest of the show. So let's go back to the basics. Oh, what, that's supposed to be recording? What? Episode 2, Daniel in the Robotic Lion. Gooba, it's Daniel in the Lion's Den. Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to another episode of Back to the Basics. As always, I am Professor Zeitreis, and this is my trusted assistant, Gooba. And this is Gertrude, my trusted assistant. Ah, uh, yes, Gertrude. Sadly, the time machine can't revisit time periods we've already been to, or we might run into ourselves, creating an unknown consequence. As a result, Gertrude has become a permanent part of the team. With robotic superpowers. Well, I wanted to make sure she had a great quality of life. So, I gave her one super upgrade. Robotic braces. Who is he walking? Thereby eliminating the one major liability that most likely drove our species to extinction. Those poor dance birds. They never know what hit them. She's the third member of the TTT, the time-traveling trio. We've already got badges and a theme song. Aha! Uh-huh. Well, what's most important is that by allowing her to live in our time under close observation, her survival shouldn't disrupt this space-time continuum. So long as she keeps a low profile. <laughs> Speaking of her profile, she's now on the internet. She can be found on most social media sites under the name Gertrude 6000 BC. Hashtag new in town. Hashtag old school. Hashtag the flood life. Say cheese, Gertie. What is this, Gooba? That is not keeping a low profile. But she only has one follower, which is me. That seems pretty low. Hashtag first friend. Hashtag best friend. Cuba, a low profile is her not being on the internet at all. We can't have people noticing a new species of bird. You need to erase that at once. But that's not fair at all. 
Hashtag not fair at all. And Cuba, for the love of schnitzel, please stop saying the word hashtag. <gasps> hashtag okay. Now, children, for today's time-traveling adventure, I've chosen a famous children's Bible story that is so very close to my heart. We all face moments in time where what other people want us to do will not line up with what God wants us to do. In those moments, we must put our trust in God and continue to follow His path, even if we end up in a lion's den, just like Daniel. A lion's den? Hashtag what? Also, the Bible says that Daniel is visited by an angel. Can you believe it? <laughs> I would love to have a first-hand account of seeing one. On that note, to the time machine. Okay, children, we will now prepare the time machine for travel. Last trip was a disaster. So Kuba and I have implemented a checklist. That's correct. The time traveling trio checklist. Item one, set the timer for Daniel. Timer is set. Check. Item two, set the time machine for Lion. Lion is set. Check. By turning the time machine into a lion, we will be able to seamlessly blend into the din, becoming almost indistinguishable from the other lions. <laughs> In addition, starting with this trip, we will always have the time machine transform while traveling through time. We must not chance having our transformation be spotted. And last but not least, item number three. I will not exit the time machine no matter what. Precisely. Check. Unless I have to. What? No! That's not part of it. Professor, shouldn't buckling up be a checklist item? Why? We are both buckled up. We surely won't forget twice. Well, Gertie isn't buckled up. <gasps> oh no! Go? We are the time traveling trio. The Professor and Gertie and yo. We are the time traveling trio. We have arrived and are blending in perfectly with our surroundings. By my calculations, we should be inside the very lines then that Daniel is thrown into when he disobeys the king. I'll be honest. I feel like you've done a pretty bad job of explaining this story to me and the children. Who is Daniel? And why is he going into a lion's den? Does he work for a zoo? Or is this some kind of a treasure hunt scenario where the lions are guarding an artifact? Well, Gooba, my hope is that we will be able to witness the story unfold, providing you and the children with all of the information we need. All we need to do is wait and watch, and hopefully see an angel. It seems my robotic lion doesn't blend in as well as I thought. It's probably because Gertie's legs are sticking up out of the back of it. Also, her legs are like 10 times the size of us inside. That's weird. But Einstein, that's because outside the time machine you grow into normal size. She must have gotten stuck during the transformation somewhere inside the time machine. I must find her at once. Gooba, you're in charge until I return. Uh, in charge of what? <sighs> this is new? Watching for Daniel! Yes, sir. Wait, what does Daniel look like? Well, I guess it's up to me then. Keep your eyes peeled, Goober. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm on the lookout for Daniel. I'm on the lookout in the lion den. I'm on the lookout for Daniel. I'm on the lookout. We time traveled again. Drawing a picture of what he might look like He's probably got two arms, two legs, and two eyes A nose and a mouth and some hair and a beard And a shirt that says Daniel so he's not hard to find I'm on the lookout for Daniel I'm on the lookout in the lion den I'm on the lookout for Daniel I'm on the lookout We time travel
world again. I don't know the story. He must defeat lions, or maybe he's stronger as in a disguise, or a superhero from all of my comics who wears the long cape and is able to fly. He's on the lookout for Daniel. He's on the lookout. While I look for the bird, he's on the lookout for Daniel. I need to find her. The robot looks absurd. Judah, I, King Darius, issued a written edict that stated that anyone who prays to any god or human during the next 30 days except to me shall be thrown into the lion's den. You now stand accused by my administrators and satraps of continuing to pray to your god three times a day. How do you respond to this? King Darius, I, Daniel of Judah, do not deny praying to the one and only true God. Just as I have always prayed to him three times daily, I continued to do so during the 30 days of your written edict. My king, I must inform you that this will continue, even at the threat of being thrown into the lion's den. Then I must honor the written edict and follow through with the punishment. You shall be thrown into the lion's den for one entire night. At dawn I shall return. May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Ah, oh, Professor, you may want to get up here. I can't hear you, Gooba. I've already told you that. Gertrude is incredibly stuck. I may need your help soon. Oh boy, Professor, this Daniel guy sure is in trouble. Hey, it's kinda dark in here, isn't it? Wait, who said that? Who's there? Oh, sorry, pretend I'm not here. I just wanna see how God gets you out of this mess. Those are wise words, stranger. Our God is an awesome God, and he works in mysterious ways. You know, that is so true. I once lost my hat and couldn't find it for an entire day. So what did I do? I prayed to God. Sure enough, after that prayer, I found it. It was on the top of my head the whole time. The power of prayer. The power of prayer indeed. Thank you. Gooba, I need your help now. Get down here! B but Daniel just came down here. We might miss something. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to show King Darius and his people your power and greatness. Please protect me tonight so I may leave this lion's den and speak of the one true God. Gooba, I need your help now. Get down here! Oh, all right. I think if we can unhook her braces, we can get her legs back into the time machine. But what about her braces? Won't they be stuck in this time period? No, Gooba. 
Uh, they are completely uh, fused to the time machine itself uh, and should travel back with us when we go. Uh, for now, I just want to get her down uh, so she don't miss anything. Oh, you already have. Uh, 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 what? Get off of me, but uh, why did you tell me? I tried. What have I missed? Have you seen Daniel? Yep. And what about King Darius ordering Daniel to be thrown into the pit because he broke the written edict? Yep. Then Daniel was thrown down into the den. They covered it up with a hole. It got really dark. And then we talked a little bit about my hat. You what? Then all the lions started approaching him. He started praying, and a bright light started shining all around him. Ah, and since the angel appeared? Well, I don't know. I came down here. What? Gooba, why didn't you stay for the angel? You said, and I repeat, I need your help immediately, Gooba. Get down here now. Ah, Gooba, we must hurry. Gooba, we missed everything. Oh, including the angel. It's all I ever wanted to see. Well, technically, you missed everything. I saw most of it until you made me come help you. Hashtag your fault. How long were we down there? Uh, has it been in an entire night? I must pass differently inside the time machine. Daniel, son of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Lift Daniel out of the den. Yes, ha <laughs> ha. Everything worked out just the way it was supposed to. Even though we didn't see the angel, at least we saw Daniel exit the pit triumphantly. For me, that is good enough. Come, let us be off. Wait, Professor, I don't think it's over. It looks like some more people are gathering at the top of the pit. Ah, well, Gooba, for this children's finley show, it is over. We must leave at once. It seems like they're about to go in the pit. Oh, dear, it's definitely over for all of us. Setting the time and date as fast as I can. Yep, they are definitely going in. <gasps> hey, maybe it opens at the petting zoo now. Those are the administrators and satraps that accuse Daniel of the crime. Uh, uh, Oh, so now it's their turn. I guess you could say that. Hey, look, the lions are waking up and they look so excited to be pet. Those people are so lucky. This is going to be a petting zoo experience they'll never forget. Go, but we have to go. Wait, Gertie's not buckled up. There's no time. We have to go. We are the time traveling trio. The professor and Nailed it! Ah, we are back! And Gertie's leg braces are back too! Hashtag blessed! What an exciting adventure we had today! Ha ha! We visited the famous children's Bible story of Daniel and the lion's den. Also, we missed the angel. We didn't miss Daniel putting his trust in God and continuing to follow his path, even when he ended up in a lion's den. In the end, God actually rewarded Daniel's face by making him the highest administrator in all the land. All right here in the Bible. And I didn't exit the time machine. That should be a given, Gooba. But I guess I can congratulate you for that. Who knew I could talk to Daniel while inside the time machine? Wait, you were serious? This episode is in the books. Literally, the Bible. Say cheese. <laughs> Hashtag time traveling trio. Duh, Cuba, stop posting pictures of the dance bird. But she's a member of the TTT. Hashtag TTT. And stop saying hashtag.
This is the story of David and Goliath. There was this boy named David, and he was a shepherd. And there was this giant named Goliath, and he was hurting everyone. David went to King Saul and said, I'm going to kill Goliath. And then King Saul said, do you want this armor? Do you want this shield? Do you want this sword? And David said, these don't fit me, but I have the power of God. Then David went to fight Goliath. And, and then Goliath laughed. David put a stone in his slingshot and fired it at Goliath's forehead. Just took one. Do you want to play hide and seek? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, hide and seek. When you're not here, we come. Hide and seek. The key to being good at hide and seek is really tapping into the gifts that God gives you. I am really quiet and blend into any environment. As you. As you. Danny? Are you still playing? The game's over. Everyone went home like an hour ago.
Who made the sun? Who made the moon? Who made the aardvark and the boom? Who made the species human and then dropped us here on Earth? Who made the whales and polar bears? Who knows our names and numbers? Who hairs? never sleeps and always cares and tells us what we're worth? Do you know what's in the Bible? Is it true? Is it reliable? Absolutely verifiable. Let's all take a look in the Bible. Did he say Bible? Do you know? Is it true? Is it reliable? Absolutely verifiable. Let's all take a look in the Bible with Buck Denver. So the Bible is a book. It's got pages and words just like other books. But if you open it up, you realize it's actually lots of books. 66 to be exact. There are books of history, books of poetry, books that are really letters written to different people or churches. Are there any books about ponies? Um, no. But there's even a book that talks about the end of the world. But we'll save that one until the end. It's a little tricky. Wow. So the Bible is sort of like other books and sort of isn't. That's right. Most books are written by just one person. The Bible was written by more than 40. Most books are written in, oh, six months or a year. We think the Bible may have been written over as much as 1,600 years. 1,600 years! That's like writing a book from the end of the Roman Empire until today. Done. That's incredible! And now, uh, through the magic of a popsicle stick of puppetry, uh, we bring you the story of everything. Everything? Pretty much. God, the man, the world. It's a genesis, man. It's the beginning of everything. Okay, let's hear it. A long time ago, right about uh, here, uh, there was God. God is a cloud? It makes about as much sense as showing him as an old man with whiskers. I see your point. The Bible says God is love, but when we tried to show him as a heart, he just looked like a valentine. Mm, too hallmark. Right. He appeared to the Israelites as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The fire thing was a little scary. So we decided to go with the cloud. I think we made the right choice. I couldn't agree more. In the beginning, there was nothing but God. No planets, no stars, no trees, no iguanas, no toaster ovens, no kids, no eyeglasses. Chester! Nothing, just God. And then he created, he spoke, and the universe came into being. The earth was formed and cooled and water appeared. Then God caused the plants and the fish and animals to pop up. And then he said, watch what I'm going to do next. This is going to be great. And boom, he made the man and the woman. They didn't have any clothes, so they had to stand behind the bushes whenever anyone took their picture. What? You know, for kids' Bibles and stuff. So God put Adam and Eve in a wonderful garden with everything they could want, and he gave them this uh, free will. That's right. But to really have free will, they needed to have a choice to make. So he put a tree in the garden and said that if they loved him and trusted him, they shouldn't eat from that tree. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. Trust him or trust the voices they heard around him. They chose poorly. By turning away from God, they said they didn't believe him. They were going to go their own way. And sin entered the world. What sin? Sin is when we ignore God, when we go our own way, when we put ourselves first in front of our friends and neighbors and in front of God. When we say to God, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do it my way. Sin entering the world changed everything. Why? Because of who God is. God is so pure, sin cannot be near him. Now that serpent knew that. He was trying to hurt God, and he knew if he could get Adam and Eve to sin, then they couldn't be close to God. God's most beloved creatures would have to live their lives apart from him. Couldn't God just change the rules so they could be with him again? He can do anything, right? Yes, God can do anything. Anything except change his own nature. He can't change who he is. If God changed who he was, he wouldn't be God anymore. So even though it made God very, very sad, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden and live new lives in a wild, mean world. Now they're a long, long way from paradise. Yes, 
is they're a long, long way from home. And now the world they're in ain't very nice because they're living on their own. So once again, we ask the question, who do you trust? Who do you listen to? How are you going to live your life? This is a choice we've got to wrestle through. Every girl and boy and man and wife. This isn't a very happy story. Nope, and unfortunately, the rest of primeval history only gets worse. Sin has a way of spreading, so much so that one of Adam and Eve's sons turned on his brother and killed him. Oh, no. Then there were more and more people and more and more sin until God's creation was drowning in sin. God decided the only way to keep his creation from drowning in sin was to drown the sin. So he flooded the whole world. Oh, I know this story. Yep, all that sin was washed away. Unfortunately, so was most of his creation. But he chose one family led by one man to start over. Noah. That's right. Noah had tried to avoid sin all his life so he could be closer to God. He wasn't perfect, but he was a good man who listened for God's voice. That's why God chose him to start things over. Him and a bunch of animals, of course. Who came in by twosies? Except for the ones they used for food. They came in by sevenies. You see, Noah trusted God and listened to God, and God used his family to start over again to give his creation a second chance. So patriarchal history is the story of God working through a series of fathers to save the world. Let's take a look. It's about 2000 BC, or 2000 years before Jesus was born, and we're in the city of Ur, possibly the biggest city in the world at that time, which was in what is now southern Iraq. Have you heard of Iraq? Yes, it's been in the news. Anyway, that's where Abram lived. Abram? Who's he? He's our first patriarch. There he was, minding his own business when God launched his rescue plan by tapping Abram on the shoulder. Abram heard a voice say, leave your father's house and go to the land I will show you. Abram figured this voice was God and thought he better listen to him. So he and his wife Sarah left Ur and wandered off following God's voice. And so God's plan began. That's how it starts. Two people wandering away from town. Yep, an act of faith. That's always how God's plans start. Someone hears God's voice, they believe, and they follow. And God uses them to do amazing things. Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, his promises come true. If God is who he said he is, then we can trust his promises, so hallelujah, look what God can do. By faith, Abraham left his home in Ur. What's faith? Faith is believing that God is who he says he is, and that he'll do what he says he'll do. God said Abraham would have a son, even though his wife couldn't have kids, and he was crazy old. And Abraham believed God. He had faith. And God gave him a son. Now, our faith grows the most when it's tested. So God asked Abraham if he would give up his son. Give up his son? Why would God want him to do that? God didn't want Abraham to give up Isaac. He wanted him to be willing to give up Isaac. God wanted to know if Abraham trusted him more than anything. Wanted to know if he would let go of everything before he'd let go of God. So what happened? Did Isaac have to die? I don't like this story. Hold on. At the last minute, as Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac to give him up to God, God sent an angel to stop him. And then he provided a ram for the sacrifice to take Isaac's place. Now God knew that Abraham trusted him completely. And Abraham and Isaac's faith grew because they knew God would keep his promises always. And they cried out, Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, His promises come true. The evidence in miracles says God can work a miracle, so hallelujah, look what God can do. Now Isaac lived by faith, just as his father had before him. He got married and had a son named Jacob. Jacob trusted God too, and God gave him a whole mess of sons. His favorite was Joseph. Oh, I know about Joseph. He's the one with a fancy coat. Right. 
His brothers didn't like it, though. They thought it was too flashy. Well, actually, his brothers were jealous that their father loved Joseph the most. So they decided to get rid of Joseph once and for all by selling him. What? They sold their brother? Who heard of such a thing? Actually, I tried to sell you once when you were little. What? It was just to the neighbors. I got your back. You sold me? You were bagging me. Let's not tell Mum about it, all right? You sold me? Ahem. Anywho, Joseph ended up in jail in Egypt, even though he hadn't done anything wrong. But God remembered his promises to Abraham, and he used Joseph to save Egypt from a famine. That means no food. And he became the right-hand man to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Joseph was the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. That's amazing. God even used him to save his brothers and the rest of his family from the famine and bring them to live with him in Egypt. And his brothers were so amazed, all they could say was, Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, His promises come true. Things are bad, we have no food, but Joseph is a righteous dude. Hallelujah, look what God can do. And that's the end of patriarchal history and the end of the book of Genesis. Abraham and his kids trusted God. They lived by faith and God used them to change the world. It seems like that rescue plan is a little bit stuck. Yes, for almost 400 years, the children of Israel, that's what we call them because Israel was the new name God gave Jacob, the children of Israel seemed stuck in Egypt. Abraham's descendants were certainly multiplying, but they weren't getting their own land, and they were slaves. But God was about to get his rescue plan back in gear, as it's time to meet one of the most important people in the Bible and in all of history, a guy named Moses. Have you heard of him? This is a story about a boy his name was moses and it brought his mom such joy she had to hide him it makes me shiver to keep old pharaoh's men from throwing him in the river a hebrew baby was born and hidden in a reed basket at the edge of the nile river and who should find him but pharaoh's own daughter who adopted him and named him moses he was raised in the royal palace but still knew he was a hebrew a child of israel and one day when he saw an egyptian beating another hebrew he got so mad he sort of overreacted did he call him a name um no he uh he killed him he what um Yep, he killed the Egyptian. Well, that couldn't have gone over very well. No, it didn't. When Pharaoh found out, he said Moses had to die, and so Moses did what most sensible people would do. What's that? He took off running! And now he's running, running, running for his life Out to the desert where he finds himself a wife Her name's Zipporah. And now he's hiding out with his sheep Cause he knows back in Egypt he's in trouble deep now, you probably know this story. So Moses is in the desert when God shows up in a bush. Wait, God is in a bush? Well, he's speaking through a bush. Not an ordinary bush, though. It's burning. That makes it more dramatic. Right. I can see why that would make it more dramatic. Right. More dramatic than a regular bush. But what if the bush was a dancing bush or a juggling bush? That'd be dramatic, wouldn't it? Let's stay focused. Sorry. Ahem. So God tells Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And Moses says, I don't want to. And God says, I want you to. And Moses says, I can't. And God says, you can. And Moses says, will you come with me? And God says, of course I will. And so Moses goes back to Egypt to face down Pharaoh. This is a story about a man who faced a stubborn king that didn't understand that when you park your stubborn self right in God's way, let's just assume you're gonna have a lousy day. Oh, there were gnats and frogs and the river turned to blood and there were flies and boils and the cows fell with the thud and then the locusts came and ate up all the crops and there was hail and darkness but it wouldn't stop saying no. That's right, Pharaoh still wouldn't let them go, so God had to do something very serious. 
The final plague was the death of Egypt's firstborn sons. It was terribly sad, but it finally convinced Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. To protect their own sons from the final plague, God told the Israelites to sacrifice a spotless lamb, a lamb without flaw, and put the blood on the doorposts of their homes. The angel that brought death to the Egyptian sons saw the blood on the doorposts and passed over the Israelite homes. Jewish people celebrate this miraculous part of God's rescue plan each year with a festival called Passover. Wait a minute. What was so special about that lamb that it could save the life of a boy? There was nothing special about the lamb. It was just a regular lamb. But God used a spotless lamb as a lesson about sin and a sign of something that would happen much later in his rescue plan. So what was the lesson? He was reminding them that the price of sin is death. Death was coming to the Egyptians at night because of their sin. But the Israelites weren't perfect either. In 400 years in Egypt, most of them had forgotten all about God. They were doing whatever they wanted to do. So the lamb at Passover was a reminder that sin takes our life away. Rather than losing their sons, God let them use lambs as a sacrifice for their own sin to take the place of their sons. That sort of reminds me of Abraham and Isaac. What do you mean? Well, God provided that ram to take the place of Isaac. Isaac didn't have to die. Instead, the ram took his place on the altar. Oh, it's connected. Yep, God does that a lot. The ram instead of Isaac and the lamb instead of the sons of Israel are both signs God used to point ahead to his ultimate rescue plan, his ultimate plan for saving us from the power and the price of sin. Ooh, tell me that part. I can't. It's in the New Testament, and we're not there yet. Rats. The Egyptians learned the hard way that sinning against God can lead to death. And now the Israelites were learning that this was true for them, too. Trying to live so close to a holy God was very, very hard. So, did they give up? Some of them wanted to. Some even wanted to go back to Egypt and be slaves again. But by the end of the 40-year timeout and Moses' big pep talk, the children of Israel were excited to be God's holy nation again and were ready to follow their new leader, Joshua, into the Promised Land. And that brings us to the end of the first big section of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And Adam and Eve and Joseph and Sometimes called five books of Moses He's the one whose life composes The storyline of all these books With the exception of Genesis Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers Read a little every day before you slumber Cap it all off with a trip through Deuteronomy Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy Parts are fun, others not so much With sinning and flooding and plagues and such Whether you're German or French or Dutch We can all learn a thing from the pen of touch That's not right Whether you're a king or a queen or a duke We, we can, can all learn a thing from the pen of touch Genesis is the introduction Tells why the world has ceased to function Quite the way God intended it from the start From the start, from the very beginning Sin came in and made a mess of all the God was gonna bless us Because we did not trust him with all our hearts And now we've fallen The world is fallen Oh yes, we've fallen Away from God It's a tragedy, nasty tragedy And now we're broken Our hearts are broken And our world is seriously flawed It's all messed up But God's gonna launch his rescue plan It starts with Sarah and Amy and the big, big promise for Jacob and all his kids. One, two, three, four, five, twelve. Then in Egypt, they get stuck. Slaves to Pharaoh, out of luck. So God told Moses he'd help out, and that's what he did. You bet your bippy. We see in Exodus, they have success because Moses respects our God and his decree. That's a fancy word for law. And now it's I, and I, the laws get piled up high. And they agree. Her 
Leviticus is a bunch of rules. The numbers the Israelites act like fools. Forty years later, Moses schooled them again. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. We'll try harder, the young one said. Moses gets older, now he's dead. Follow Joshua instead, all the way to the promised land. We like the Bible, it's not a fluke that it all starts out with the Pentateuch. Adam and Joseph and Whether you're a king or a queen or a duke We can all learn a thing from the Pentateuch Before we get to Matthew, Mark and Luke We really need to understand the Pentateuch The historical books are the next 12 books Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther What's next, Sunday School reading? That brings us to the 8th book of the Bible Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Ruth is a tiny little book that's easy to read. It tells just one story, the story of a woman named Gladys. I'm kidding. Her name is Ruth. Once upon a time, there was a woman named Ruth. She wasn't an Israelite, she was from Moab, a country Israel didn't like very much. But Ruth, she married an Israelite. As our story begins, Ruth, her Israelite husband, and her husband's mother were all living in the Moab because there was a famine in Israel. So there they are in the Moab when, oh no, Ruth's husband dies. I don't know what happened. Maybe he got hit by a bus. I don't think they had buses back then. Okay, maybe he got hit by a cow. Chester. A goat? Chester. A near tempered iguana? Chester. Now, Ruth's mother-in-law, her name is Naomi. She doesn't have a husband either. He died a while back. Probably another iguana. Chester! Or something. Naomi doesn't really belong in the Moab. She's an Israelite. So as soon as the famine ends, she decides to go back to Israel. Of course, she is old and has no husband and no money. So she'll have to beg for food. Her life will be sad. Well, guess what? Ruth doesn't want that to happen. She loves Naomi. So even though Moab is her home, Ruth says to Naomi, I will come with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Oh, isn't it beautiful? I'm telling you, that part makes me cry every time. Yeah, that's really something. A anyway, this amazing Ruth, she leaves her home and goes to Israel with Naomi to take care of her. Every day she follows the workers in the fields to pick up little bits of grain to, to share with Naomi. Oh, I'm losing it, but... But get this, this is the best part. So she's picking up a bits of grain in a field that belongs to a wealthy man named Boaz, who happens to be related to Naomi's old husband, the one that died in the iguana accident. I don't think he was killed by an iguana. Whatever. Anyway, Boaz sees Ruth into the field and hears about what she's done for Naomi. He hears about her great love for her mother-in-law. And to get this, he falls in love love with Ruth. Wonderful Ruth. And, and Ruth and Boaz end up getting married. And Boaz takes care of Ruth and takes care of Naomi, her mother-in-law. And everyone is happy. Oh, gather round kids and hear me sing. All about Israel's godly king. See what good this guy can bring in the books of First and Second Samuel. Israel is a nasty mess. Just read Judges and get depressed. A king could help them pass the test in the books of First and Second Samuel. That's the books of First and Second Samuel. Samuel was a prophet, and a very important prophet, because God used him to find and help Israel's king. So God sent Samuel out one more time to pick a king, a godly king who would follow God's heart rather than his own. And this time, God had him pick... David! Right? Am I right, or is it someone else? David. 
David was a son of a man named Jesse, who was a son of Obed, who was a son of Ruth and Boaz. David was a godly young man from a godly family. Samuel anointed David with oil. That was a sign that God was choosing him. As soon as Samuel anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Tell him about the promise. What promise? You mean the one about the land and the nation and the blessing for the world? The one God gave Abraham? Oh no, it's a new promise for David. That's right, Brother Louie. God is so pleased with David that in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, he makes David an amazing promise. God tells David that someone from his family, one of his descendants, will rule over God's people forever. Whoa, that's a big promise. It sure is. This promise is called the Davidic Covenant. Davidic? What kind of word is Davidic? The word Davidic means about David, or having to do with David. Oh, so if something was about Ian, it would be Ianic. Well... And if it was about Clive, it would be Cloivic. <laughs> Cloivic, that's funny. Hilarious. This promise for David, or Davidic covenant, is so important that in the New Testament, when Matthew talks about God's rescue plan, he puts King David right in the middle. So God's ultimate rescue plan, the blessing for the whole world, is going to come from David's family. Hey, shouldn't we sum up everything we learned with a song? That's a great idea. Let's sing it in the river, in our canoes. If you open the Old Testament and read it categorically, you'll find a dozen books that we are meant to read historically. They tell the tales of Israel, there's nothing metaphorical, and that is why these books are in the section called historical. Oh, hello, Clive and Ian. Hi there. Hello. Oh, Joshua and Judges and Ruth and both the Samuels. First and second kings in front of first and second chronicles. Ezra, Nehemiah, and now there's just one more to fall. Esther is the final of the books we call historical. And what do we learn from these books? Anyone? The dad will keep his promises always and forevermore. And he is always with us, no matter what may be in store. But from these books, the lesson learned that peace with God cannot be earned from Joshua to Nehemiah. What they need is a Messiah. So, as we're wrapping up our journey through the books we call historical, we'll ask another question, and no, it's not rhetorical. Do you think that you are good enough all on your own to get to God? Or have you learned from Israel that humankind is badly flawed? They tried a thousand years but couldn't right their wrong behavior. And that is why for you and I the answer is a savior. Yes, yes that, that is why for you and I the answer is a savior. That's just what we need. <laughs> and maybe a paddle. The Old Testament is filled with poetry. Nearly every book has at least a little poetry, but right in the middle, we hit five books that are almost all poetry. We call these books the writings. Job is an interesting book about a guy who loses everything and has to take a look to see if he only trusted God because his life was grand could he still be trusting if all he had was sad and sores all over his body yes that too Psalms is 150 songs you could try to sing them all but it would take too long They'd write a psalm when they were glad or when they'd been invaded And nearly half of all the psalms were written by King David He must have been very busy Indeed And then along comes Proverbs A book that's full of Proverbs Short little sayings that make us wise And teach us how to live our lives What's cool is that a lot of them 
were written by King Solomon. That almost rhymed. It was close. What's next? Ecclesiastes, 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 Ecclesiastes. If life seems meaningless and hard to understand, listen to the preacher and he'll give you your hand. Cause there's no need for questioning your sanity. No vanity, a vanity, everything is vanity. When you're thinking, you're thinking in the sand. Trust God and follow his commands. Now one more book in the writings. Though I don't find it particularly exciting. Song of Solomon. Mushy, mushy, mushy. Celebrating love between a man and a woman Engaged to be married Saying silly things like My dear, you've got goats in your hair He doesn't seem very wise Perhaps you'll like it when you're older No, I don't think so And those are the writings Job and Psalms and Proverbs Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon Hairy sheep teeth The end The next section of the Old Testament is called the Prophets and some of the books are very, very short. Pastor Paul, what is a prophet? Several Hebrew words are translated as prophet in English. The most common means one who is called. Most importantly, a prophet is someone who speaks for someone else. In the Old Testament, that someone else is usually God. So in the Old Testament, a prophet is someone who is called by God to speak for him. The major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the minor prophets are all the others, except Lamentations, which tags along with Jeremiah in the major prophets. So the prophets did what exactly? Prophets were kind of like alarm clocks. Beg pardon? An alarm clock is a wake-up call. If you're about to miss something important because you're asleep, like school or church or your wedding, an alarm clock goes off and wakes you up. It yells, hey, stop sleeping or there's going to be trouble. Most people I know don't particularly like alarm clocks. I don't like my alarm clock at all. Sometimes people really don't want to be woken up. And the same was true of prophets. When Israel wasn't following the covenant, when they'd sort of fallen asleep in their relationship with God, God would send a prophet like an alarm clock to sound an alarm, to say, hey, wake up or there's gonna be trouble. And just like with alarm clocks, it didn't always go so well. The first book of the prophets is a book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a really long book with 66 chapters. The book of Isaiah is so long partly because Isaiah's ministry as a prophet was so long. The name Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. So what's important about Isaiah? What do we need to remember? That God is holy and will judge sin, but also that God is the one who can save us. Yahweh is our salvation. King Hezekiah got it right. King Ahaz didn't. That's right. Most importantly, Isaiah tells us that God can save all of us through the Messiah. Isaiah announces a Messiah who's for everyone, not just Israel. What else does he say? Isaiah says this Messiah will be punished for our sins. All the punishment we deserve will be put on this Messiah instead of on us. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah is saying, look ahead, look forward. It's all about the Messiah. What a great message. What a great book. But we gotta keep moving. We need to sing a song to summarize all of them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Lamentations. Ezekiel, Daniel, without hesitation comes Hosea, Joel, and Amos, then Obadiah, Jonah, Mike, and Nam, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. 
Then just three more tiny little guys, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These are the prophets, they're raining on fire. They're in two sections called the Major and the Minor. They bring God's messages. Judgment, instruction, aftermath, bright, bright future if you're walking on a godly path. Being those prophet could wear you out quick from sleeping with the lions to staring at a brick. Reading about the prophets, prophesying to the government teaches us important stuff about the new covenant. And how the Messiah's gonna pay for our crime. Let's go through the just one more time. Isaiah, Jeremiah, the and then Lamentations. Ezekiel, Daniel, without fire. hesitation, comes Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Then Obadiah, Jonah, Mike, and Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Then just three more tiny little guys, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They're in two sections called the major and the minor. And that's a quick overview of the Old Testament. God promised Abraham that he would make him a nation and that if they followed God's rules, his laws for how they should live, that God would bless them and live with them. Of course, they couldn't follow God's rules perfectly. They kept messing up over and over again. So Isaiah and the other prophets hint that a new solution is coming, a new covenant. And that brings us to the New Testament. Are you ready? This is where it gets good. So, where do we start? Revelation? Uh, no, that's the end of the New Testament. The epistles? No, we need to start at the beginning. The Gospels. Alrighty, the Gospels. Um, what is a Gospel? Good question. You've probably heard the word Gospel before. But what does it mean? Uh, Pastor Paul? The word gospel comes from the old English word Godspell, which means God's good story. This old English word came from the Greek word euangelion, meaning good news. So gospel means good news. And don't tell me this good news. It's the news about God's blessing for the world, the one we've been waiting for, the Messiah. But in church, I learned that the New Testament is about Jesus. So what does Jesus have to do with the blessing for the whole world, the promise God made to Abraham? Good question, Ian. If you've spent much time in church, you probably know that the Gospels tell the story of Jesus. But how could the life of one man be God's blessing for the entire world? What did he do, and what does it matter to us? What is the good news? Then without further delay, the story of Jesus. I'm sure you all have heard the story of Jesus being born. Every Christmas, a manger, an inn, the star, the wise men. Right. The story of Jesus' birth is told in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Mark and John skip that part and start when Jesus is already grown up. But even Matthew and Luke don't start with the birth of Jesus. Luke starts with the birth of a guy named John. And Matthew starts with Jesus' genealogy. Do you know what a genealogy is? A genealogy is a record of a person's ancestry. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on and so on. Matthew traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Abraham. And right there in the middle, halfway between Abraham and Jesus, is King David. So Jesus is related to King David. So what? Wait, the Davidic Covenant! <gasps> oh, right! The promise God made to David that one of his descendants would rule God's people forever! Exactly. Matthew starts with Jesus' genealogy so that everyone who knows the Old Testament would say, Hey, Jesus is a descendant of King David. You know what that might mean. It meant God's promise to David could be coming true in Jesus. Exactly. Right from the start, Matthew connects the New Testament to the Old Testament and says the promises God made to Abraham and Moses and the Israelites are coming true today. Well, what happened between him being born and being all grown up? We don't really know. Luke tells one story about Jesus when he was 12. But Mark and John don't even start until Jesus is already 30. 
For them, this is when the story of Jesus begins. And it begins with John the Baptist announcing that everything God has promised is about to come true. So Jesus shows up and asks John to baptize him too. And as Jesus comes up out of the water, the sky opens and the Spirit of God comes down on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven says, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Whoa, so that voice was God talking. Which means Jesus is God's son, the son of God. And the spirit that came down is the spirit of God. Wait, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? That's the Trinity, we learned about this. We sure did. God is one God with three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are God, and yet God is one. I remember this part. It made my head hurt then, and it still makes my head hurt. The important thing is that now all three persons of God show up at one time in one place. Whoa, the people watching must have known something big was going on. Something very big was going on. So, what happened next? After his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, Mark tells us that Jesus went back to Galilee, the place he grew up, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Gospel! That means good news. Now Jesus picks 12 men to be his disciples. Uh, Pastor Paul, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of a teacher. At the time of Jesus, many rabbis, teachers of God's law, had disciples who followed them everywhere, learning everything they taught. John the Baptist had disciples of his own, some of whom started following Jesus. So Jesus picks 12 men to be his disciples. These guys are really important, and some, like Peter and John, end up writing books that are now in the New Testament. Jesus is teaching in Galilee, and people are amazed at what they hear. Why were they amazed? Was he really good at math? No, it wasn't that kind of teaching. Jesus was explaining the Old Testament scriptures, what the prophets meant when they said certain things. There were lots of teachers back then, but Jesus taught with authority, explaining things in ways no one had ever heard before, explaining things like he was God. But then Jesus started doing something even more amazing. He started healing people, people who were sick or blind, people who couldn't walk or who couldn't use one of their hands. Jesus just touched them or even just said a word and they were healed, completely healed. That must have gotten people's attention. It sure did. Suddenly Jesus was surrounded by huge crowds. Everyone wanted to be close to him. Jesus' teaching and miracles were attracting a lot of attention, including the Pharisees, who wanted to know who this new guy was and if he was following all their rules. So while the Pharisees and Sadducees try to figure out what to do, Jesus keeps traveling and teaching and healing people. He tells little stories called parables that teach about the kingdom of God. He explains how we should live in this kingdom. He calms a storm on the Sea of Galilee, showing he has authority over nature. He feeds 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, showing he has authority to create abundance out of little. And he even brings a girl back from the dead, showing he has authority even over death. Now Passover was coming around again, so they all headed to Jerusalem. So Jesus and his disciples gather for the Passover meal, just like all the Jews did every year. But Jesus does something very different that no one expects. First, he says one of his 12 disciples is going to betray him, help the Sadducees and Pharisees grab him and take him away. This freaks everybody out. Then Jesus picks up a piece of the bread they were eating and says, this is my body, which is given for you. Then he picks up the cup they were drinking from and says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Wait, what's going on? Was Jesus saying that, that he was the Passover lamb? He was the one who would die so that we could live? That's exactly what he was saying. 
Jesus took the Passover meal, where Israelites celebrated being saved from death and from slavery by the blood of a lamb, and said he was that lamb, that his blood could take away sin and death from everyone, the blessing for the whole world, the new covenant God was making with his children. <gasps> new covenant? That's what New Testament means. <gasps> This is what the whole New Testament is about. The blood of Jesus is the new covenant. The whole Bible points to this moment, from Genesis when we learn how creation was broken by sin, to Abraham, Moses, and David, to the prophets who say the answer is coming, the Savior is coming, the Messiah is coming. The entire Bible is about this. But the story isn't over yet. Jesus goes to a garden to pray. He knows what he has to do now, and it isn't going to be easy. After he prays, he turns to his friends and says, The hour has come. And right then, his disciple Judas shows up, leading a crowd of guards to arrest Jesus. They put Jesus on trial, first at the Jewish court called the Sanhedrin, run by the Sadducees and Pharisees. His crime? Blasphemy saying he was equal to God. His punishment? Death. But the Romans don't let the Sanhedrin put anyone to death themselves, so the members of the court drag Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And even though Pilate doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong, he doesn't want the Sadducees and Pharisees to complain about him to Rome like they've done with other governors before him. So he gives in. He washes his hands in front of everyone, a way of saying, this isn't my fault. And he has Jesus killed, crucified, by nailing him to a wooden cross. The people around Jesus just saw a man dying on a cross, but that's not what God saw. God saw something very different happening. God saw his son, the son of God, on a cross. Then he saw the stain of our sin appearing on Jesus. Your sin, my sin, everything selfish and mean we've ever done or ever could do. The stain of all that sin was appearing on Jesus, even though he'd never done anything wrong at all. God saw his son stained with all the sin of the world. He saw him buried under all that sin. He saw him die under all that sin. And since the punishment for all that sin is death, death away from God, that's how Jesus died, alone, away from God. The last thing Jesus said was, God, God, why have you left me alone? That makes my heart break. It makes me wanna cry. So, Jesus took the punishment for my sin. He took the punishment that I deserved. He died alone, so I wouldn't have to. I gotta think about that for a minute. But if he died, how can we say Jesus has power over death? Because he didn't stay dead. Jesus was crucified on a Friday and placed in a tomb that night. On Sunday morning, two women who were followers of Jesus went to the tomb and discovered something incredible. It was empty. The huge stone that blocked the entrance had been rolled away and Jesus wasn't there. Matthew and Luke both tell us that the women meet an angel who says Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. This is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. This is what we celebrate every Sunday, but especially on Easter Sunday. They didn't have to take the angel's word for it though, because Jesus appears right in front of them, living, walking around and talking. And then Jesus appears to his disciples, and then to more than 500 people. Jesus proved that he had authority over death itself, that the power of sin and death was broken, that the kingdom of God was real, and that we can all be a part of it. Wow, that's not just good news, that's amazing news. So is this it? Is that how it ends? Jesus tells his disciples to go tell everyone, spread the blessing to the whole world so everyone can hear, so everyone has a chance to be a part of the new kingdom. 
And then, according to Luke, Jesus blesses his disciples and disappears into the clouds. Around 30 years after Jesus left his followers on earth, Luke sat down to write the history of everything that had happened from Jesus' birth up till that very day. He wrote his history in two parts. The first part told the story of Jesus, and the second part told what happened in the 30 years after Jesus left. His followers were called apostles, a word that means sent ones. Jesus sent them into the world to spread his message. Right. That's why the full name of Luke's second book is the Acts of the Apostles, but we call it Acts for short. Luke starts the book of Acts with the same scene that ended his gospel, Jesus saying goodbye to his disciples. But he tells them something interesting. He says they should stay in Jerusalem and wait for a gift that God the Father is going to give them, a gift that will help them spread the good news about Jesus throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It was 10 days after Jesus left them, 50 days after Passover, on a day called Pentecost. So all of Jesus' followers were together, kind of hiding away to try to keep out of trouble. And suddenly, it sounded like a huge wind filled the house. And then something that looked like little tongues of fire came down on each one of them. Did they catch on fire? Did they stop, drop, and roll? Luke says it was like fire, not that it was fire. So no, they didn't catch on fire. Writing some parts of the Bible was tricky because the authors were trying to describe things that no one had ever seen before. So when Mark says the Spirit came down on Jesus like a dove, or when Luke says the Spirit came down on Jesus' followers like tongues of fire, it wasn't a real dove and their heads weren't really on fire. That's just the best way the authors could come up with to describe what people saw. So what powers did they get? Did anyone start shooting web? No, no web shooting. The first thing that happened was they all started speaking in different languages. The Holy Spirit gave Peter the power to get up and speak an amazing message about who Jesus was. Peter proclaimed the good news, and about 3,000 people who heard Peter speak became followers of Jesus that day. That power really helped them a lot. The apostles were preaching in the temple almost every day. So the Sadducees had them all arrested and thrown in jail. But that night an angel came and let them out and then told them to go right back to preaching in the temple. So sure enough, the next morning when the Sadducees walked in, there were all the apostles out of jail and preaching in the temple. <laughs> I'd love to see the looks on their faces. They were amazed and furious. And so they had the temple guards beat the apostles with whips as a punishment and then let them go. The apostles who were beaten actually thanked God that they got to suffer for the name of Jesus. These are the same people who, when Jesus was arrested, ran away and hid. When Jesus was on trial, Peter told people three different times that he didn't even know Jesus. And now he's fearless. He's talking about Jesus no matter what happens. He's like a whole different person. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. Whoa. I sure wish I could be that brave. You can. This is the best news of all. You see, the same Holy Spirit that filled Peter and the apostles will fill us if we're following Jesus. Whoa, how do I get it? How does it work? Tell me more. It's all a part of God's rescue plan that we'll be talking about through the rest of the New Testament. But first, we need to finish the book of Acts. God was going to pick someone very unusual to carry the good news all the way to Rome. Someone the early believers were so afraid of, they wouldn't even let him in their homes. Someone absolutely perfect for the job. This young man was a Pharisee, a very strict Pharisee, and he thought anyone who followed Jesus should be arrested, or worse. So how does someone who thinks Jesus was wrong end up being the guy who spreads the good news of Jesus farther than anyone else? That's a good story. Uh, Sunday school lady? As Paul was traveling to Damascus, a bright light from the sky hit him, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul fell to the ground and said, Who are you? And the voice said, I'm Jesus, the one you're trying to hurt. 
Meanwhile, in Damascus, there lived a man named Ananias, who was a follower of Jesus. He had a vision, like Peter on the roof, and Jesus shows up in his vision. Saul is the one I'm going to use to spread the good news about me to Jews and Gentiles and even to kings. So Ananias goes and finds Saul, and when he puts his hands on him, immediately Saul can see again. And Saul becomes a follower of Jesus and starts running around Damascus saying, Jesus is the Son of God. Wow, that's quite a change. He went from arresting people who believe in Jesus to telling people to believe in Jesus. Is that when they changed his name from Saul to Paul? No, his Jewish friends always called him Saul, and his Gentile friends always called him Paul. Luke starts calling him Paul in the book of Acts when he starts traveling among Gentiles. Paul started preaching and teaching in Damascus. He was so smart that no one could argue with him. The next 13 books in the New Testament are the Pauline epistles. Pauline? Who's she? I don't think it's a girl's name. Pauline is a girl's name, but that's not the way we're using it. The word Pauline means of Paul. And epistle? Epistle is a Greek word that means letter. So the Pauline epistles are the letters of Paul. Everywhere Paul went on his three big trips, people started following Jesus. All the Jesus followers in a city would meet together and form what we call a church, a word that means a group that assembles together. But Paul couldn't stay and keep teaching every one of these groups, so when they had questions about what Jesus taught or about how they should live as his followers, Paul would write them letters. Before they had the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the churches needed help to know just what to base their lives upon. So Paul wrote them a letter. He'd write them once, he'd write them twice. And make the problem better with helpful hints and good advice. what they need? They need it. Letters of Paul, the letters of Paul. Some are short and some are tall. Tall? You mean long. But that doesn't rhyme. Letters of Paul, the letters of Paul. Some are big and some are small. Oh, I guess that works. Many of the ones he sent are now in the New Testament. And one and all, from big to small, can read and love the letters of Paul. Well, that's fantastic, but what are these letters? What? You want us to name every one? Yes, every single one. All right. Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and then Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Next is Colossians and 2 Thessalonians. Someone should hang these up in the Smithsonian. Now up to Timothy 1 and 2, there's only two left for reading through. Titus Philemon, our last of all. Titus Philemon, so very small. Titus Philemon, the last of all. And, and those are the letters, the letters of Paul. Great. Those are the letters. Yep, those are the letters. So, what do they say? Back to Paul. We are justified, given a new label, by grace as a free gift through faith. Faith? She lives right over... It's not the girl faith, it's the idea. Well, why do they name so many ideas after girls? Um, I think it's the other way around. To have faith in something is to believe it is what it says it is, and that it will do what it says it will do. That's right. To have faith in God is to believe that he is who he says he is, and that he will do what he says he will do. But you can have faith in anything. I have faith in a chair every time I sit in one because I'm believing that it will hold me up. And I have faith in an airplane every time I get in one because I believe it will take me up into the air and then bring me back down again safely wherever I want. So what do we have faith in, believe in, to get this free gift of righteousness? God? Kind of. Jesus? Closer. Jesus in a chair? Or an airplane? Nope. In one of his letters, Paul says he will not boast in anything. In other words, he won't say, I got this label of righteousness because I worked so hard, or because I'm such a good person, or because I go to church every Sunday. Nope. He says the only thing he can boast in 
is the cross of Jesus Christ. The power to justify us, to change our labels from sinful to righteous is in what Jesus did on the cross. You see, because Jesus is God, he has God's righteousness, perfect righteousness. Jesus is the only one who deserves to wear the righteous label, who could ever earn that merit badge. When he went to the cross, he took the stain of my sin. He took my label, sinful, and then he beat death. He destroyed the power of sin, and he gave me his label, righteous. His label makes me a child of God, a son of the King, and I can wear it forever. So as you're watching and learning, if you realize that you've never decided to follow Jesus, that you've never said, hey, I want to be a part of the kingdom of God, but you think you want to, talk to your parents or your Sunday school teacher or your pastor. If you're a grown-up, talk to another grown-up that you know follows Jesus. And keep watching, because we've got a whole lot more to learn. It sure is good to be done with all the letters, right, Clive? I don't think we're done with all the letters. What do you mean? He's right, Ian. We're done with the letters written by Paul, but those aren't the only letters in the New Testament. Paul's epistles start with Romans and go to tiny little Philemon. Then we have a big letter called Hebrews, and then James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude. These seven letters after Hebrews are called the General Epistles. Because they were all written by generals in the army. Um, uh, no. Paul's letters were written to specific churches or specific people. They are specific letters. These seven letters aren't written to specific people, but to all Christians or all Jewish Christians in general. Hence the name General Epistles. So none of these letters were written to specific people or churches. Right. Um, except for 2 John, which may have been written to a specific church, and 3 John, which was written to a guy named Gaius. So why are they in the general epistles? All right then, moving on. Good day, world. It's time for the last book of the Bible, Revelation, a book that I'm hoping is easy to explain. Right, Phil? Well, maybe not the easiest book. According to this expert, Revelation is one of the most complicated books in the entire Bible. Oh, um, okay. Well, that's just one expert. And this expert says Revelation is one of the most difficult books in the entire Bible. Oh, dear. It's difficult. It's difficult. And very cryptic. It's what we call. It's what we call. Apocalyptic. Full of symbols, dreams, and visions. Waves us with some tough decisions. What's this? What's this? Symbol represent. What's the? What's the? Message being sent. Crazy scenes from our creator. You might need your calculator cause in here you'll find it true that numbers, that numbers can be symbols too revelation what a trip I read it as I sail my ship these messages to John were sent if only, if only I knew what they meant Ay, ay, ay. This stuff is crazy. Studying Revelation is like studying a forest. Each sign, each symbol is like a tree. If we stare too closely at each tree, if we get lost in the details, we miss what the whole forest is trying to tell us. We have to back up. We have to get in our helicopter and fly way up high to look at the whole book and ask, what is God trying to tell us? Well, what did you guys hear? Mm, let's see. It's clear that God is going to destroy evil and set things right, but he's been waiting. Right, but he's only going to wait so long. There will be signs and warnings, and then he will step in and end evil. And the closer we get to that time, it seems, the more trouble there will be for the church, because we have an enemy. Satan who hates us and wants the whole world to work against us. But Satan has already lost. 
beaten by the Lamb. The Lamb of God, that's Jesus, who, just like the Passover Lamb in Exodus, gave his life to save our lives. He paid for our sin, so we can change from God's enemies to God's friends. So Revelation is a warning and an encouragement. It warns us that we have an enemy who is always trying to hurt us, working through the powers of the world. And things are going to get worse before they get better. But Revelation is also an encouragement because the final battle has already been won. Even though the church will suffer, our future is safe with God. We have nothing to be afraid of. So how does it end? If we don't end up on clouds playing harps, where do we end up? Oh, this is the best part. After evil is destroyed, John looks up and sees a new heaven and a new earth, restored, redeemed, cleaned of all evil. It's the kingdom of God in full bloom at last. And it's heaven and earth together. And this is how the story ends. It started with a garden and ends with a garden city, the city of God, where there is no death, no tears, no sickness, no bullies, a resurrected earth cleaned of sin and evil, where we will live, work, eat, play, sing, and dance with the God who made us and loves us very much. The world is a messy place. Spend more than a day or two here and you're going to get hurt by someone or something. But this book tells us where that hurt comes from. Sin, rebellion, us wanting to be the ones in charge. It also tells us how we can be saved from sin by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It tells us about the wonderful work we can do spreading his kingdom, helping others, seeing ourselves become more and more like Jesus. And it tells us the really amazing ending when God's kingdom bursts into full bloom. And that is what's in the Bible. So what are you going to do now? What do you mean, what am I going to do? I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to help grow the kingdom of God. What else is there? Well, what about you? I'd like to be in the kingdom of God Where there's no crying, there's no dying It makes me want to applaud and say hey God You're fantastic and I am so enthusiastic We'll redeem creation and I get to share your invitation with everybody, with everybody I meet. And now I'd like to whistle. With everybody, with everybody I meet. Don't miss more fun with me and my friends at jellytelly.com!